first, and we have two items on our agenda today. The first is legislation regulating, requiring the installation of window guards on uh, rental housing. And then the second is the Shady Grove Minor Master Plan. I think what we'll do today is the Shady Grove Minor Master Plan will start at 10.30 a.m. Uh, and we will start now with the window guard. We may be able to work our way through that in an hour, uh, or if we have pending items, we'll come back to it. Uh, if we break early, if we end early on window guard for some reason, then we'll just resume at 1030 either way. So if you're, if you want to be here for the Shady Grove plan, you can set your alarm for 1030 AM. All right. Um, so we'll, we've got a council packet. I, um, we've got a, uh, a good assembly of uh, executive branch uh, officials and uh, maybe I'll turn it to the sponsor of the legislation for his opening comments, Mr. Hucker, Council President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us this morning. This is a very uh, simple and straightforward piece of legislation, regardless of your views on fiscal policy or solar arrays. Uh, I think we can all agree we shouldn't have to toddlers falling out of windows in too Montgomery County. Yep. I said too soon, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Still in mourning. Um, um, but anyway, uh, sorry for my ill-fated joke, but um, uh, this is something I think is, um, you know, was, was brought to my attention uh, after, I think, the, um, you know, reading about the, um, the, well, the tragic death of Ezekiel uh, Gumezi as a solution. Um, uh, he, unfortunately, was not the first toddler to be, to be killed or seriously injured from a fall in Montgomery County. Uh, Children's Hospital reports uh, 15 to 20 uh, kids die every year, and I think we have more than our share in Montgomery County, unfortunately. So uh, we've done a lot to try, to try to create safe home environments for our, our kids and our tenants in the last several years, and I think this fits into that um, that that uh, frame. Um, we're not we're not creating any. Uh, uh, new innovative policy here. These laws have been in place in New Jersey and New York for, for quite a while, in Oregon, I think, as well, um, and have been reported to be quite effective um, at reducing uh, toddler falls. That's why they were supported by Children's Hospital and the American Academy of Pediatrics and um, others that in Consumer Federation that I worked with on this bill. Um, there, I appreciate uh, Chief Kinsley being here. Um, I know we'll get to him, but there was a concern that came up about uh, fire safety that I'm sure he's better prepared than anybody here uh, to address. Um, so with that, I'm really grateful uh, to Christine for her work on this and appreciate the packet and eager to get into it with you all. Thank you all. Thank you. I should uh, I should add before we commence that uh, I own two rental properties. They are in common ownership communities. Um, I believe that as someone who has been a tenant, a homeowner, and a rental property owner, uh, my my interests are really no different than the public interest. Um, but I, I want to disclose this uh, so that it's very clear. Um, but uh, I am a co-sponsor of the legislation, and I think it addresses a, a, a need. I hadn't heard that statistic that there were, you said, Children's Hospital uh, admits 15 children a year, roughly? Children's, Cincinnati, Children's Hospital here, the former National Medical Center, supported the bill and testified for it. But Cincinnati Children's Hospital reports that 15 to 20 die uh, uh, every year because it falls from windows. That's a national statistic? Yeah, nationally, and I think yeah. apparently we have, we've had, you know, one or two yeah. the last few years here, Gaithersburg and Tacoma Park. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. So, Christine, uh, if you'll take us through the packet, and if anybody wants to speak, you can text me, or as we, uh, if it's feasible, I can try to use the hand, you know, the hand wave uh, method. But, um, and Christine, if you'll uh, introduce our, you know, I know we have executive branch officials. Okay, wonderful. Um, yes, we do have a number of executive branch officials to assist us. Um, as council member, our council president Hucker stated, we have um, uh, the fire department. We also have uh, director Nagam and his colleagues from DHCA. We also have uh, director Pedouim from DPS and a number of her colleagues. Um, 
And I just wanted to um, invite my wonderful colleague, uh, Ludine McCartney Green, to lead you for the through the first item, and then we were planning to tag team the second item, and then um, and then I'll I'll try to walk you through the remaining items, including the um, addendums that were added over the weekend. Thanks. Sounds good. Uh, if it goes without saying, uh, check the council website. There are two addendums to the packet that address some you know late breaking discussions. Um, so if you're if you're watching and you don't have the latest version, you should check the council website. Okay, let's proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Reamer, and thank you, Christine, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> so I'll begin, um, and as uh, uh, Councilmember Reamer mentioned, there are three packets. It's the introduction packet that was dated February 24th, which I'm going to go through right now. Um, and the first question or the first amendment for the committee to consider is determining when a landlord must install a window guard. Um, so in this provision um, that's currently written in the bill is, a landlord of a multifamily rental property unit must install a window guard if, and there's two reasons or two ways, a child 10 and under is in the rental property unit or a tenant in writing makes the request for that installation. Uh, during the hearing, public hearing, AOBA had made a, a recommendation or amendment that um, instead of it being an or provision, it should be an and, meaning uh, the child 10 and under is in the property and the tenant must provide uh, in writing requesting a uh, window guard installation. Uh, so council staff has written in the packet on page three, um, line 25 would be replaced with or and an and. In addition to that, we did feel that the pro um, of doing that was that that would take the guessing out of the landlord determining whether or not the, the child is 10 or, or, or under. Um, in this case, it's an affirmative um, notification from the tenant telling the landlord how old the child is as opposed to for the landlord determining that. Um, so that's what that would, amendment would do. Um, now we did notice that, you know, maybe a tenant would not be aware to put the landlord on notice, right? And so the amendment um, would be to amend line four where the tenant would be able to sign an addendum to the lease, which a landlord would provide at the time of the signing of the lease, and that addendum would um, affirmatively be a statement from the tenant acknowledging that there's a child that's tenant under who occupies or will occupy the dwelling unit. So the first amendment for the uh, council or the committee to consider is, should the bill be amended to change the or to an and in line 25? And two, um, that the tenant is required to sign a statement acknowledging that at the time of the lease. And I'm happy to clarify any language or answer any questions. Thank you and welcome. I believe this is your first Fed committee meeting. So delighted yeah. to have you and uh, we, I really looking forward to work with you. I, I hope you'll find that working at the county council is uh, very fulfilling. We certainly do. Um, I just have a threshold question and I, I'm not sure where to direct this really, but can you just share very generally, like what kinds of windows are we talking about here? We're talking about multifamily. This is, does not apply to single family property rentals, I understand. And, but it is, I presume it's only windows that open. Uh, is it only windows of a certain type that open? You know, can you just share a little bit of that very general background? And if, if we could, you know, happy to ask DHCA or DP or DPS to, answer that as well but no I, I think that's a fair question I'm happy to answer some and then you know tag team or, or tailor off um, and throughout the packet we will go through expanding the language of um, window guards um, and I think Christina will talk about or limiting devices but um, it's windows that um, does not include the first floor as the bill is written it would be second or third or higher level floor um, and uh, it would not be windows that um, has an air condition installed or higher than is if I'm not mistaken, I think it's four inches or higher in terms of um, it not being able to uh, lift all the way. But I am gonna ask my colleagues from GCG and Christine to jump in to, to, to clarify those language as well. Um, thank you, if I may, I just wanted to state that I mean, while I agree with the chair, it is a threshold issue. It also is gonna be discussed later in the packet okay. to, as Ludine said, the way that it's currently written, 
it doesn't apply to the ground floor. But uh, through amendments suggested by DHCA, we, um, it, it, the committee might wish to flesh that out a bit. Okay. All right. Well, then let's let's return to the the core question. Uh, sorry, I distracted us probably there. So it's whether to apply to all windows uh, as drafted. It is uh, if the landlord believes there is someone tenant under, and the amendment is to require notif you know some kind of uh, you know attestment from the rent from the tenant um, and. Uh, so let's let's have some discussion on this, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so the the New York City amendment, I, I'm just calling that for that's basically what the proposed council staff amendment is, right? Um, so how? So I guess we're just an understanding. You can't guard everything with legislation. If if you're a if you're a grandmother who has a ten, you know babysits often, uh, you know, but you don't, they're not on the lease, for example, and, or that situation changes at some point, which, you know, these are, these are apartments, this, you know, this in and out, you know, this could be transient population. There's no duty to, for anybody to have any window guard, unless the resident were to know themselves to request it. Is that basically if we adopted that amendment, is that how that how that would play out those situations? Uh, yeah, Council Member um, Joando. So Amendment Number Two is really going to talk about the notification, okay. where um, it would be on the onus for the landlord to provide notification to dictate whether the tenant should assert is their child that's tenant under, um, if there's not, or for no reason provided they're requesting uh, a window guard. So. The grandmother that you may be referring to may have a grandchild that visits, you know, throughout the week. Um, so she doesn't have an actual child living in the property, but she would be able to request based on that notification being provided um, annually. And we'll talk about that because there's some amendments to be made there. I think now it's talking about do we agree with or does the committee want to look at the amendment and require the tenant to sign it? Because right now, the way how the bill is written, there is no requirement or a cessation or acknowledgement from right. the tenant. Um, but the second amendment does talk about the category of notification and putting a tenant on notice um, and, yeah. and probably talking about that grandmother that you're referring to. Well, yeah, you know, and then I, that was gonna be my second issue. There's there's a lot in the leasing process and we talk about this a lot in, in the committee of rights that you are, you know, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be aware of and the language that's in, how it's included. And, um, you know, so there's obviously an issue, a concern of, people understanding what they're signing, uh, but there's no perfect solution here. So, I mean, I, I think, I guess the, if the bill sponsor is satisfied with the New York solution, I'd be satisfied with it. I just, I just want to point out that I don't know if there's a more, I, I would just be worried that this is a life and safety issue. We want to make sure that it's really, I guess maybe this is a DHCA question or the standard lease is updated. So it's really, really clear uh, that that is being asked and, and, it, and it becomes part of the practice of, of, you know, being really pointed out to, to prospective tenants. So I don't know, do we have someone? There you go. Uh, so, director uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, CM Nigam, director DHCA. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to do an amendment. We'll have to come up with the amendment to the lease and communicate that amendment to the landlords that this is something which they need to ask their tenants specifically whether or not they have a child 10 years or younger of age, you know, living in a unit. So that's something which we'll have to do on our end. Okay. And Council President Hucker, you were going to say something. Um, I, well, I mean, I obviously. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just. <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. I think. Um, um, but, you know, we were comfortable with the bill as, as written. I don't like the idea of changing or to and. I do, I, I, it's very sensitive to your suggestion that, um, that um, you know, in all policy, we kind of do the best we can with the information we have. And I think, it's, I think it's the right thing to do to require landlords to put these in units where there are, there is a, a, a child. Um, and we all know what a child, you know, 10 and under looks like. I mean, I don't think there's going to be any enforcement if they're, you know, uh, 10 and a half and, uh, 
there's not going to be any of that. There is, as, to your point, um, a, a lot of grandmothers and grandfathers in apartments. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in the what was now the point was the Georgia Towers. Um, a lot of a lot of people on the same floor babysitting kids while parents are running errands or things like that. And so I do think it ought to just be um, easy for a tenant who knows that they might be in a babysitting situation like that, um, caring for a child, to request these. Um, and they'll find out about it. I think if we have a vigorous notification provision, which is which is the yeah. next item. Great. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I guess I'm still trying to understand how does the landlord know if there is a child living in the unit? So, Councilman Reamer, you know, at the time of the lease signing, right, that would be something that they would ask, um, or that this is what this attestment statement is, is that is there a child um, that lives in the property as tenant under? That would actually be a provision or an addendum to the lease um where the tenant would make that assertion of that right that that i understand how it would work if the tenant provides that information what i'm less clear on is if the if we don't have a separate process where the tenant provides that information how this would work uh, you know efficiently and then what what liability is there like a liability question if like the, you know the tenant doesn't tell the landlord that they have a toddler and then that there's an injury, you know, who's at fault? So that's one of the questions I was sort of trying to understand. Um, Andrew. Yeah, so I'm just curious, a couple of things. One, I agree, you know, for the most part with everything that's been said. Um, I have two two points. One, you know, I do think it should be handled through the lease with a transition. You know, there, there's an issue of people who are in existing leases and how do they have the opportunity to request this? I think in, in a new lease, that is the most appropriate way to address that. But we need a transition clause to address the, you know, 100,000 people who are currently in a lease, you know, some of whom, you know, require this. And uh, they need, you know, a clear opportunity uh, to do it and an easy process through the uh, information campaign, uh, educational campaign that uh, Council President uh, has uh, talked about uh, requiring as part of this bill. Um, you know, what that looks like, I don't know. I don't have the right answer here, but, you know, I'd be supportive of, of, of that, um, you know, and appreciate the rationale behind the bill, uh, certainly. Um, the... The second question is is really related to New York. If we follow what New York does, is there a problem? Like, are, are, you know, they passed a bill, right? Bills always have consequences. You, you, you know, we all acknowledge and have acknowledged that nothing is perfect. We're trying to solve it as best as we uh, can. Have we learned of, you know, implementation issues that they're having uh, with that, challenges that they're having that we're trying to address here? I mean, is there a you know, a specific basis for us not to follow what they're doing beyond hypothetical? So New York has been the prime example um, and, and very much supported um, on, on both sides from, from a housing perspective, from an advocate perspective. Um, and, and, and they have um, a, a very successful legislation with the and provision, right? That it's, it's, so instead of the or that we have here currently written, uh, New York does have the end, um, and and that would be, uh, and Council President uh, Hucker, I'm not sure if you're going to add to that too as well. I didn't mean to inter interrupt you. I was going to wait, but but uh, that 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 seems di different than the New York notice that's published on page four of the packet, which says if a child ten years of age or under lives in your apartment, or if you ask him to install window guards, him the landlord to install window guards at any time, you need not give a reason. Right, so that's regarding the, the annual notification. So I wanna make sure I'm clear on a couple of things. The original lease would have an attestation or an addendum, right? right? And then there would be a requirement for an annual notification uh, to be given. In that annual, annual notification, that's what's on page four. That's a similar format that New York uses where we would address, is there a child, is there not? Or three, there is no reason mm -hmm. the tenant is just making that request. Uh, there's some amendments there because right now, it's not an annual notice. So the amendment for uh, that would to make it annual. Um, and then the question following that is, 
when would that annual notice occur? Is it the beginning of the of, of the year or is it at the time of leasing or, or, or renewal? Um, so just want to make sure that there's two separate things and want to make sure we're not mer merging them. We're talking about lease renewal now and attestation, and then we'll talk about an annual notice to cover uh, the basis for um, uh, throughout and, and those that are unaware of, the, of that. And just to supplement, um, it, you, it is correct, Council President Hucker's correct that the New York is the or. So you would leave it as or in order to, if you, you know, want to follow their pattern. New York is or? Correct. Either you have a child tenant under or you, as the tenant, request in writing that you want um, a window guard. It doesn't matter if you're, if you have a tenant or under person. So that's two different paths. I see. I mean, the confusion about the and is the, the occupant who has a frequent visitor, but is not really a, you know, doesn't live there. Like if you're, as you said, grandparent or an uncle, you know, and your relatives visit you, I don't think you would say that that's an occupant, but we still want that person to be able to request and get an installation. And yeah, I, I was sensitive to the grandparent issue. I raised it you know, as I was reading the packet and asked that same question because that is such a common uh, dynamic and, uh, you know, uh, you know, across all communities and then babysitting uh, and day, you know, kind of informal daycare, you know, I, I would call it uh, uh, in, 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 in other communities, which I think we need to really, you know, think through. Um, you know, I think the question is, I mean, I, without overcomplicating, because I totally agree with the, the, the thought process, at a certain point, um, like there are there are provisions of what constitutes a gap, like an approved, you know, over a certain number of, um, uh, you know, visit, you know, for instance, if somebody has a, you know, a, a, a significant other who's not necessarily on, on, on the lease, you know, who stays over on the weekends, and you hit a certain number of days that's supposed to be disclosed, uh, you know, on the lease. I, you know, so, you know, the, the question would be if there is a way to address uh, that issue in a thoughtful way, I'm not sure the answer to that, but I think, you know, I, I do think it's very important that we address the, you know, the grandparent issue and the, you know, babysitting, um, you know, inform I'll call it informal daycare situation. Um, I think I prefer the or language. It just doesn't seem to create a loophole to me. Um, you know, it puts an affirmative obligation on the landlord to install one if there is a child. And then it says anyone who can, anyone who asks for one can get one. And then separately through the notification process, although I think I'm inclined to support the lease notification process myself, but I'm still thinking about it. Then the landlord will uh, be able to determine more without guessing whether there is a, a someone under the age of 10. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, any committee, so committee comments here. Yeah. Uh, so I agree with the or, I guess we'll get to the notification in a second. Uh, Ms. McCartney Green, the the bill and, you know, liability was raised by Mr. Reamer. I'm, I, I, you know, that's obviously the a, a consideration here of, you know, if the unthinkable happens, which we know, you know, does happen from time to time, uh, unfortunately, it, you know, what is, have courts interpreted, have, I, I doubt, I don't know how long that law has been in, in, the, in place. If you have someone who signed the lease, didn't notify, a tenant, you know, just because, which is very, there's a lot of things in the lease. And, and, and we all know that the way folks are notified about what's in a lease is varies greatly. Um, and <clears throat> if you don't say anything and there's no window guard and you do have a child, you know, with you, uh, you have children and, uh, you know, maybe you're renting a two bedroom and it's pretty known that you have children and something happens, where would the, is, is there any testing of, where that liability lies that's the that's the thing i'm concerned about as well i don't want to create you know uh, something that you know because that's really why we're doing it we want to keep people safe but there's also the liability question so is there any 
information you have on that? Yeah, and actually talking about the notification and amendment uh, two um, brings up that because that was one of the things that AOBA brought up as a liability and actually um, listing language that should be legislated. Uh, council staff does have a, a, a different opinion um, concerning that um, and that if notice is provided to the tenant um, that a trial court should be the one um, uh, in charge of understanding the tort law and, and where liability should be apportioned. Um, and that it should not be an automatic uh, provision or clause that we include in our in our legislation or code. Um, uh, to be honest, a landlord has the opportunity for identification clause or different things to put in their lease. Right. Uh, but I want to be careful about whether or not that's something that should be legislated in the code when there is uh, tort law, there's you know, contract law, and different things where um, a, a, a judge is able to decide mm -hmm. based on the mm -hmm. facts. Of, of where that um, liability should be apportioned. Um, so that is something that, that's kind of rolled into Amendment 2. Okay. Uh, when we talk about the notification, yes, the question is, where does that liability shift to? Um, and mm -hmm. our recommendation mm -hmm. is to allow that to be um, handled in the process of a court of law um, and not something to legislate in the provision in the, in the Okay. In the okay. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I'll hold, hold that powder, and I'll, I'm, I'm fine with the or as well then. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's, let's go to the second item. So, and I'm sorry, but just to clarify, so in item number one, you're sticking with or, and in addition, you're adopting the lease uh, addendum that requires the tenant to say whether they have a child under 10, correct? Right, yes. Thanks. Oh, thank you, right. Okay, moving on. So amendment number two, which we've really talked about it, and, and I'll explain a little bit more, is to require a landlord to provide notice annually. Currently, how the bill is written is just to require notice. Um, so in this provision, it would um, not only require notice manually, but that checklist, which you can see that New York provide would be very similar. Uh, uh, and DHCA could create a sample or a template for, land, for, tenants, uh, for landlords to use but essentially it would uh, identify three different things, um, whether a child is 10 or younger occupy, uh, whether they will occupy and the tenant wants to request it, and whether a window guard um, requires repair or maintenance. Um, so that is the notification that would be provided um, annually. And um, the amendment number two also mentions, uh, what if the landlord sends a notice tenant does not respond within 30 days, um, then if the landlord does not have actual notice or doesn't know the desire of the need for the window guard, then they may at reasonable time um, con with the consent of the tenant conduct a physical inspection of the dwelling unit. Um, so this is an amendment for council you know, or committee to consider. Um, one, should we require the notice to be annually? Um, two, if we are going to require the notice to be um, annually that the tenant signs it, um, if the tenant does not sign it in that case, um, after 30 days, as I mentioned, uh, whether we would allow the, the, the landlord to conduct a physical inspection with consent and um, whether that um, is sufficient there for the, the notice requirement. I have a question uh, for DHCA. Are there other annual notifications that property owners are required to provide to their tenants? Yeah, I'm having Rosie join us momentarily. Uh, there may be, but I'm not fully aware of it. That, you know, whether within the lease, if they, we are asking our landlords to certify, I know for tax rate properties, for the income certifications, there is uh, something in the lease that, that I, know, I know there's a lot of information in the lease and we have a, yes. we have a template but, lease and we but, have but I'm not aware of a standalone communication that is required and that's that was my 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 first question is so in terms of standalone certification if it's an income certification this is a tax rate property then then a tenant is supposed to provide income certification documents to the landlord oh, that's no, but but which is different from what we're talking about here. In this case, this is a different matter. So I'm going to 
hopefully Rosie will join us soon to see. Uh, I want to. I don't want to miss Mrs. Speak here. I see I Dan is here. I don't know if Dan might be able to answer that question. Or yeah, just real quick, we we ha they're required to put in the annual rent survey on an annual basis, along with a uh, for the troubled properties. They're required to submit uh, forms for that as well. But that's the so, landlord that is required. Landlord, yes. The county, not yes. the tenant. This is not the tenant. No. For the landlord to send something to the tenant, Christine. Uh, yeah, Chair, Re Chair Reamer, I just wanted to point out that the the issue that you're raising is also an issue that was raised by AOBA, which uh, and and this relates to one of our addendums, but I think it's proper to bring it up now. Is that they um, AOBA suggested that. Um, instead of an annual notification that these notifications regarding window guards um, would occur, well, number one in the lease, as you've already discussed, and then uh, whenever rent is being, whenever there's a notification to the tenant about a rent increase or um, at least renewal. Yeah, um, I just, I, my, what I'm trying to get at here is I think it would be very helpful and appreciated if we can build this into existing systems as opposed to creating a new system. and. There are many points at which landlords are obligated to share certain information with their tenants. And I think it is good to have this built into that so that there will be multiple times that a tenant has the opportunity to specify that they are, uh, you know, that they have, that they want one. Uh, they don't even have to have a child, but they can, they just want one. And so if we could think about it that way, I think it would, I just think it would have a different administrative impact. Uh, Council President. I, I totally agree with that, um, Hans. And um, I, I, I think, yeah, you're, gonna, you're likely to get, uh, it would be less burdensome and more likely to achieve widespread compliance if it's built into existing systems. I would add, in addition to the mechanisms that Christine mentioned, the tenant handbook, I think, would be a good place to notify tenants that they have the right to this, to right. get at the... Um, both parents and occasional babysitters, grandparents, um, you know, people in, in relationships or things, things like that. And I shared with you, I, I found this more recently, but um, in an email I just sent, uh, New Jersey has a little bit more of a belt and suspenders approach just in terms of the frequency. They require the written notification. They actually require it twice a year. They also require the lessee to be verbally informed of the right to request window guards by the landlord uh, verbally and um, uh, the notice in the lease has to be in boldface type. So they obviously thought through uh, making sure tenants are aware of their rights. Right. So um, how do we, so if there is interest in that, how do we, how do we hook it into those kinds of communications as opposed to creating a different standalone, you know, annual mailing? I think I addressed that to the Dean or, yeah, I think as we mentioned, you know, instead of annually, it would be at the time of uh, lease signing, lease renewal, um, and I don't know if we want to also consider rent increases, although we're in the middle of COVID and that, you know, some of those, that's not happening, but um, those are kind of succinct times when a landlord is communicating with a tenant, um, so we could look at those um, uh, suggestions that Abel was, was, was mentioning. Or we did that, we have DHC. Go ahead, Tom. Or rent survey, right? Yeah, I mean, could we could we ask DHCA to follow up with a, mm -hmm. what those what those communications are that, that we have to to work with uh, rent surveys, you know, all these things that have been mentioned, um, you know, putting it in the landlord tenant handbook, it could be in the law, but it doesn't have to be. I think DHCA could put it in the tenant handbook if they want to. So, you know, it would be good if we could have DHCA just respond to us as a follow-up with what some of the opportunities are, as well as what they would do administratively, whether through regulation or just simply through program administration, how they would notify tenants. Um, again, I think the goal is for as many opportunities as a tenant has, you know, to see that they can check the box and, and have this installed, you know, without kind of needlessly creating excessive administrative requirements or duplicative, you know, so on and so forth. Sure, we'll check in with our ALTA staff on this issue 
and we can uh, get back to the to the committee in the follow up meeting. Okay. 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 And just for clarification, one of the other amendment was that the tenant would sign that notification. So if, if that's in regular form of what we are the practice that they would sign it um, would be the the. Now does that, but that. Okay, I guess. We have told if they don't sign it. Yeah, well, and is it do they have to sign it every single time, or is it they would sign it when they want one? Do you know? Because it. Because it's a well, you know, it depends. If it's annually, then yes, right. But if it's a part of the practice of the lease renewal, you know, right. that's something that may occur, but that's triggered at that time frame. That we would want them to sign. I think that would well, yeah. Again, I think let's ask DHCA for a little more consideration. I presume we would want them to build it into the model lease. Uh, you know, I think we should always be careful about. Sure, but what we have to lease all our staff. Yeah, um, but. That sounds right, you know, that that it's something that the tenant signs on. I guess, again, to the earlier point, like, to avoid also creating a lot of paperwork where there's an annually signed document that has to be kept on file, you know, that it, it seems like we have existing systems to use, to, you know, for that, such as the lease. So just to clarify, is your point that the signature is to ensure that there is understanding of the right to request it so that could be through the lease that could be through the first uh, transition of the first one you know if there's already an existing lease yeah i don't know i'm trying to understand. but not every year you have to say i again i don't have 10 year old children right. i don't want to have i think we want to avoid that we want to avoid every single tenant in montgomery county having to sign a piece of paper and every landlord having to keep track of that i think we want to avoid that uh, and that we have existing systems to use. How do they do it in New York? I get, yeah. How do following they... the New York model and they have an annual notice, which seems appropriate. How do they do it? And we don't have to create uh, all of our, you know, new systems. We can look at what systems are currently working. New York right, so... does it annual. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kristen. Oh, no, I, um, so Every yes, single New tenant, has... the millions of tenants in, in New York City have to, Affirmatively sign, and then they have to keep the wet sign document on file oh. somewhere. Is I'm there not sure like if they have to keep a warehouse the wet sign in New Jersey that is carrying the hundreds of millions of dollars of documents? It seems like a lot of paper to me. Uh, New York does have the annual notification, um, and then they have a follow up provision in which the landlord. Um, does a physical, if they don't hear back from the tenant, the landlord is required to do a physical inspection of the property to determine whether a 10 year old or younger. But, but does the annual, does the annual uh, notification require the tenant to sign it and return it? So, well, I, I, I'm just looking at this Jersey thing, which I think is similar. They do it twice, but to New York, the, the you have to notify in writing and if it's signed, the the lease or the renewal lease is can be can, is one of those times, right? So that you're going to have one signed opportunity through that. The in that and that's right now this bill only requires one, I think. So it I, it's a, to Hans's point. If you build it in something that's already signed, like a lease or a lease renewal, which is what the New Jersey model allows for, is what I'm reading with Thompson around, and I'm assuming New York does as well it's already a written piece of paper. So it's not a new piece of paper. Now we could require it to be bolded and all that, which I think is good information. I'm not saying that that's your yeah. question, Andrew, but. Right, no, no, and I appreciate that. I, you know, I think through the regulatory process, we work out the bolding of POM, I mean, I'd be a little concerned about being too specific because yeah. we couldn't change it if we legislated. I think DHCA is, you know, certainly uh, has the best of intentions on that. And I think we're in agreement here. We don't want like an annual signature where 98% of people who don't have you know, 10 year old children have to do. We want to make sure we're protecting the 2% that do who are at risk, right? Like that, and make sure that they're aware of their rights uh, to, to do it. As long as the, 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 the affirmation on the lease or the lease renewal or whatever counts as the signature, you know, we don't want to create, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper and files and, you know, all of that. It seems like that's an administrative burden on the tenant and the landlord if there's no uh, need, need for it. So as, I, I think we're all in kind of agreement here. We just have to figure out how to make sure that we're you know, making that happen. Hi, hi, this is Rosie. Um, I'm sorry, I had a hard time sounding off. 
I agree to that adding it to the lease renewal paper would be the easiest thing to do because it's just the extra line on there because you are, already have to offer the two-year lease and a few other things. So just adding in the thing about the um, window barriers would be easy to do. Also, I just have a, okay, um, clarification. Can these things be installed just by leaning out the window from the inside and then screwing it into the frame? Is it pretty simple like that? I got that impression just from looking at the products, you know, that are on the inside. Floor. You don't have to lean out. Oh, you don't even have to lean out the window. You're on the inside. You're on the inside. So this is a $35 product that you can install from the inside. With a screwdriver. And the, and the owner, if the owner doesn't want to have it, or the occupant, I should say, if the occupant doesn't want to have it, they can sort of disengage it pretty easily and put it in a closet or something like that? Um, Basically, yeah, because you have to be able to remove it relatively easily for yeah. fire safety purposes. Exa okay, exactly. So we're talking, I mean, it, it is, help I wasn't sure about that. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask about the windows and everything. Like, it's one thing if they have to hire someone on the exterior of the building mm -hmm. set the stories up. If they can just put this product on in the course of their building inspection, you know, when they're turning over the unit and so on and so forth, like this is this is pretty minor. Okay. Yeah. Oh. It's like it's no more complicated than installing your smoke detector. Right. Um, and no, they. Uh, I think it's uh, confused people. We've all seen security bars or what people call burglar bars that are iron and affixed to the masonry on the outside of a building. Right. Um, those create a, a, both a fire concern and um, they are you know, installed by professionals and not intended to come off because they're intended to protect an adult from getting through the window. These are flimsy little things that are just strong enough to keep a toddler from falling out, but they can be installed with a screwdriver by any adult. Um, and we're, we'll talk about fire, fire safety later, but they allow access and egress. That's well. helpful. Cause then I think that sort of gets at, you know, what are you trying to do here? I think what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get it, let property owners to install them. You're, you're okay if the requirement is pretty much to install them everywhere. And then the occupant will decide if they want to keep them up or if they just want to put them in the closet. And not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And the cost is minimal and, you know, administratively, it's probably ultimately going to be easier for the building owners to just install them and be sure that they are there when the unit turns over, you know, and, and then not, actively manage whether you know there's this provision about going in to inspect and all that stuff like you know th that probably exceeds the cost of you know just installing them uh by you know tenfold um okay that helps me understand this a lot better thank you where so where are we here we're talking about the the lease requirement i think ladine Yes, yes. So we talked about the notification and how we want to succinct that with our current processes. So we'll go back with uh, GHCA to talk about that and, and, and look at that language. Um, I want to bring your last attention to that amendment is the liability um, uh, a clause or amendment. If that <clears throat> is something that the committee wants to um, consider, as I mentioned before, um, council staff um, uh, believes that this is something that is falls uh, strictly under tort law. Um, and something that should be decided in a court of law. Um, and like I said, the landlord has the op opportunity to put an identification, identification clause or a hold harmless clause in, in their lease. But um, our recommendation was not to legislate uh, exemption from liability from a, from a land landlord. I agree with that. Yeah, who, who who asked, was that in the legislation or did someone- I'm sorry, and I should have prefaced that by saying that AOBA had made the recommendation or amendment um, to the bill to include that um, essentially, if the notification was given to the tenant and tenant does not respond within a reasonable time, um, that they would be absolved from liability. Um, I just want to, Christine, you briefly. Yes, and this this is um, this issue is specifically mentioned in addendum two to the staff packet. Um, but as as Ladine, the only thing I would like to supplement on what Lou, what Ms. McCartney Green already said is that. Um, I don't, our staff council does not believe that we can change the state tort law. So I don't think that's, I don't think it's an appropriate issue for um, yeah. legislating into the county bill. No problem. Uh, 
the attorneys of our stakeholders often want us to be able to do things that we can't or won't do. <laughs> and uh, that's. And sometimes we try, but yeah. here it looks like we're in agreement that we, this is not an appropriate area for us to try to delve into. All right. Uh, with that said, I'm going to just turn this over to Christine uh, or Ms. Wellens, who's going to continue with the remaining amendments that we have uh, to review. Okay. Um, thank you. And being sensitive of your time, I believe you have about 10 more minutes allocated, so you might be able to get through one or two more issues, but we can see. Um, so item uh, in the in the council staff memorandum, um, page six, item three would be whether to permit certain exemptions or variances, sort of a variance process by which the director of DHCA could um, could um, by regulation have a process in which um, a landlord could say, it's not feasible for this structural reason for me to uh, install a window guard in this particular window and therefore I need a variance and this and this amendment would allow DHCA to through a regulatory process grant those uh, variances. We did have a supplemental comment from AOBA, which is mentioned in the second addendum, which they would like for this this um, this amendment to be slightly um, they're changed. They're supportive of the amendment, but they want it to be um, not just if they want a variance to be available, not just if um, installation of the window guard is infeasible for structural reasons, but also just they want it to be just infeasible or otherwise infeasible um, to catch situations in which um, the the situation they mentioned was lead paint. Mm -hmm. And if for environmental reasons, if they can't um, install the window guard. So well, if, they have, if they have lead paint, doesn't legislation say it has to be removed anyway that's not a reason not to put a window guard in a window let's yeah let's not talk about the whys but the the if i understand a fair point uh that occurred to me but this is a request from dhca that they be given a variance or is this a request from somebody else uh, it's, it's a request from a <laughs> this is an aoba request okay uh is there any reason why DHCA believes that there should be able to be some narrow variance that DHCA could provide when the installation of a window guard would be infeasible? Unless there's some barrier with the building itself, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't have it. I mean, it is hard to imagine all the situations structurally i mean it looks like this is simple fix and it's put in from inside of the unit but it's hard to imagine some of the older multi-family buildings maybe the way the windows are set up structurally you know it's difficult to put the window guards in we don't know uh, we may be conjecturing over here but there may be some situations i mean there's no the harm in allowing dhca to have a variance right i mean this is not an entitlement it's something that dhca has to approve right and it says it says the regulations may include yeah. so I, i'd be comfortable if you're just allowing them the authority i think that is right. fine me too and dhca could decide at any time whether it's appropriate to do it right agreed okay sounds fine thank you um Issue number four, it relates to a transition period, which Council Member Friedson um, was, was speaking to earlier. Um, in order to make clear, you know, how, how this bill would roll out, um, the committee might want to consider adding an uncodified transition period. Um, the, the, what we have stated here, which the committee obviously could modify, um, if you wish, is that DHCA would be required within 30 days of the effective date of the act to publish on its website a sample annual notification. Um, and then within 60 days of the effective date, the landlord would provide the initial annual notification. Of course, this relates back to the issue on which you're going to get uh, more information on the DHCA, um, that being the annual notification. Um, so, I think this transition period would probably have to be massaged 
um, depending upon what you decide with the annual notification. And then the other, just to supplement that, um, AOBA also has uh, subsequently suggested that there be an effective date of, I believe it was like October 2022. Um, they, they sent uh, comments to the committee indicating that uh, there should be a longer transition period uh, given the cost, especially in the time of COVID. Andrew. Yeah, well, if, particularly if we're going to have an education campaign, I think that, you know, and I, I think that that certainly makes sense, but we should think about the timing related to that because you do want the notices to go out at a point at which there's been some time for the education campaign for the tenants to understand what the notice is telling them and what their rights are and, you know, to kind of identify it when they've seen it. So I think we should think through how that all works together with that. I agree that, uh, you know, thinking through related to the um, the annual notice and how this, uh, you know, fits together. And then I you know, also think we should think through a little bit of um, whether there'll be some discomfort of having people come into, you know, I know people are less likely to have and be comfortable with folks coming into their units during COVID for public health reasons. So there might be some sensitivity uh, to that, given the unique moment that, that, that we're in. Having said that, this is a health and safety issue. And so we should be moving forward on it in a timely manner. So I don't have any specifics of what that means. I just think those are the what various the, aspects of it that I think we have to think through and be thoughtful about how they all work together. So we have asked DHCA to give some thought and then follow up with us about how they think we can do notification. And I think we can probably get a better recommendation from them about how to phase it in, you know, based on that as well. Um, I mean, anyway, it might be fine to require an initial mailing, you know, followed by subsequent through the leases, you know, or I don't know if DHCA has a, a mailing that goes out to the tenants. Um, if they do, they could include something. I, I don't know. So we'll ask DHCA to just follow up with us on that point as well. Okay. Oh. Rosie, is that you? Who's I that? Think that? I think that over a year and a half from now for it to go into effect is too long. Yeah, I don't think uh, <laughs> yeah. we weren't discussing when it would take effect. Uh, really. I mean, we had a someone that I think AOBA made a suggestion, but what is, yeah, how, how is it? How is it drafted in the in the legislation? Just normal yeah. six months, right? Yeah, October first, twenty twenty one, makes a whole lot more sense than twenty twenty two. Yeah, I think the question is when. How how will the tenant be notified? I mean it. And what does it mean to take effect, actually? You know, is that point, does that mean that, how do these things sync? I think that's just the, the only question yeah. I have. Yeah, because there's an education campaign by the county, by DHCA, that should be immediate once the bill goes into effect. Probably can start before that, frankly. But, yeah. um, you know, and then there's the point at which then once the bill goes into effect, the time that landlords would be then required to send notice and, you know, all of those things have to kind of work together. Uh, you know, we certainly control the DHCA piece of it. And so it would be helpful also to know, at least from my perspective, and I heard a yeah from the bill sponsor and council president uh, of, you know, how, how long DHCA expects uh, it to take uh, once the bill is passed to put together the education campaign and actually reach the folks who need to be reached. Okay. It's going to be the push, but I think we can do it. Just like a slight note, you know, thinking about what a I would imagine property owners, many property owners will not want these things to always be there. Uh, they may be considered to be somewhat unsightly, or if you are a tenant who does not have any concern about it, you just don't want it to be there. Um, you would rather have a nicely painted, you know, window sill, uh, window frame. Um, so I, I don't know how this will work out exactly, but, uh, you know, just sort of thinking over when, Landlords will install them. Will tenants be allowed to remove them? I guess they are, right? I mean, I mean, if you put it in and I can take my screwdriver and take it out, what's to stop me? Nobody, you know, 
Yeah. Now the um, sorry, Chair Reamer, the as the bills drafted, the tenant would not be permitted to uh, remove it. I think that's something we ought to think about. You know, I mean, uh, I'm, if I'm if I don't have children, I might not want. I might prefer to just to have a unobstructed view through the window, um, and you know, less clutter in the room. Um, so I don't know. There's just something to think about. But these are only being installed by the request. Once they're there, but once they're there, and then the room turns over, you know, the unit turns over. Does the does the property owner remove them as the unit turns over, or do they just leave them? That's a. I don't, I don't think it's up to the property owner. Yeah, it, Unless I there's it, a 10 year old that's about to move in, you know. Yeah, no, I'm it's saying it's, up to, it's, about it's to up to the property in. owner. Um, right, the um, only issue is that if you do have a child under 10 and that's the reason, you know, window guard is required under the bill, um, that then the tenant is not permitted to remove it on their own. But, you know, if you had it just, you had requested it, you changed your mind, that's a different scenario. And then, as you said, the, the turnover, there's nothing in the bill that would prevent the landlord from, you know, clean slate. My new tenants don't have any kids. They don't want a window guard. They could take it down. Okay. So that's probably how it would work is they would just say, hey, do you want this or not at the start of each lease? Great. Okay. So we've got some follow-up. We'll return to this. Uh, Thank you to the bill sponsor, and we will move on to the next item. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Okay. I am done. Casey Anderson, why don't we start with uh, some <laughs> opening comments about the the plan and the process from the planning board, uh, and then we'll take it to council staff. Uh, thank you. As we discussed last week at the briefing, I think there are really only a couple of major decision points uh, in this plan. Uh, I'm not going to say that there's total unanimity with everybody who has any interest in this, but this is, uh, as Gwen would like to say, a happy little plan. And um, it's or I say it's about the happiest little plan you're going to see uh, probably during this uh, council cycle. So I hope that um, you'll agree that we've uh, hit the mark. I think there's the council staff have made a number of constructive suggestions, and I don't think we really have any uh, fundamental issue with the land use uh, tweaks that they have have recommended. But we can you know I think uh, hash that that out. It should be pretty straightforward, and we hope to get through this in just a couple of work sessions. Okay, sounds good. Okay, um, unless one of the council members wants to say something, we can get started, does that sound okay? Yeah, let's get started. I mean, well, I just wanna say, um, we should have a briefing on the bus depot relocation. Um, so, I, 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 we're not doing that today, obviously. I don't know that we need to even do it in the time that we have allocated for the this master plan review. But it is a overriding important issue about the implementation of the plan. So I know there's a lot of interest in it. So I guess I would ask Pam if you could uh, you know, talk yeah. to council staff and we'll request an update um, on that. And it, I do wanna say it's possible that the, the news of MCPS procuring electric buses could have a positive influence on that. Um, it's possible that, you know, we could work it out so that a new depot is for electric buses, which don't create exhaust and don't make noise. And just for example, you know, every, well, every property that we have considered as an alternative location for this depot, the obvious response has been why, you know, from, from some neighbors there are like, this is too loud and it's too much, too much exhaust. You know, you can't bring that to my neighborhood. And, you know, sort of understand that, that human reaction. So now that we are having a, a bus technology without exhaust or noise, perhaps it's easier to fit this replacement depot 
you know, into a property acquisition. So uh, having just said that, for those who are interested in that topic, we will nevertheless come back to this uh, more generally soon in the next, you know, next couple months or next month. All right. Pam. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so just my starting off comment is about uh, Chair Anderson's comment that this is a happy little plan. Happy, yes, little, no. <laughs> uh, the name minor amendment is a little bit, um, I don't know, it throws you off a tiny bit. It has been a lot of work. This plan covers over 2,000 acres. It's a large land area for a sector plan and for an amendment. Um, I think the, the reason for the name amendment is the, really the motivation for it was to amend just certain things in the plan. And then when the planners get in and they start looking, there had been the sectional map amendment in 2014. And it really did require kind of relooking at if you're going to reconfirm, what does that mean for most of these properties? So um, it's been a tremendous amount of work. Um, planning staff has put into this plan. It's well organized. It's um, uh, easy to follow. Um, I just, the little part <laughs> is not quite true because it's quite big. And, and the properties in the plan, I'll just start out, are also very, very large. So when you will hear some of these um, FARs, they may seem low, but when we're talking, you know, 24, 25 acre properties, it's quite a bit of um, development potential. Okay, so with that said, um, as most of you know from the briefing that was done um, for the council last week, this land, um, the sector plan area has uh, a lot of major transportation facilities around it, routes, bus lines, metro line, rail line, um, Quarter Cities Transitway is going to hopefully be built into it. You've got the ICC, um, so it has a lot going on. You are gonna get a completely separate um, briefing and staff report from Dr. Orlin on the transportation elements of the plan. Um, otherwise, the sector plan's been organized around eight categories. Uh, um, urban design, um, I just want to find them so that I can tell you, um, land use, housing, mobility, parks, trails, and open space, sustainability, historic resources, and community facilities. So the staff report before you today actually covers everything but the mobility part of it. If we get through the whole thing today, that's great. We may not, um, in which case we can bring back the rest of it at the next work session or following the transportation um, review. We can figure that out as we go. Um, you also know that this uh, sector plan is bordered by three municipalities, the city of Rockville, the city of Gaithersburg, um, and the town of Washington Grove. Um, with that, I think that's a general overview. If, if at any time you wanna see a map of an area, I do have some slides where I pulled some of the data um, and graphics that the planning staff had shown last Tuesday, and then I pulled some of the um, images out of the, the sector plan itself. So if you need to see an area, I do have, I can share my screen and I can pull something up for you. Thank um, you. I, I just want to really briefly say, I think this is a really important plan. And I think it is a testament to the, the evolution of the county's politics, uh, as well as probably more importantly, just the changing nature of the economy and, and of our community, that there's support for development at this location. And I think in years past, we would have been fighting against, you know, a, a strong push against having development in a, there. And, a, you know, what we have now really are, is a community that's seeking a higher quality of life and more amenities and you know, the benefits that come with redevelopment. And generally, it always, uh, it's a thorn in my side that at the end of the red line in Montgomery County, we have a transfer station and we have, you know, underused land and it doesn't, you know, it's, I think to some extent it's bad luck. Um, maybe it's, maybe it was some of the suburban, you know, planning, but, uh, you know, we should, we should have strong urban nodes at all of our stations and along this red line. And, and uh, we are we're trying to create that nevertheless. So, um, you know, I, I'm enthusiastic about bringing this plan to reality and, uh, you know, thanks to the planning board for going through this. So not a small plan. It's a big vision. It's a part of the county that really wants bigger change, I think. And uh, we can certainly hopefully help deliver that. So please continue, Pam. Sure. Um, and, and that's actually a great segue because what I did want to state before we jump into going through 
urban design land use, things like that is that the vision for the sector plan amendment as they state in the plan, and I think it's important to note, is to create a future Shady Grove metro station area that is home to mixed use pedestrian oriented environment with attractive streetscapes, distinctive architecture, um, and a sense of place that complements public art facilities amenities and new mobility options. And so what you're gonna hear, the urban design um, components of this plan, the land use, uh, the sustainability section, the parks and trails, they all speak to really recreating the whole environment around the Shady Grove Metro. So they do speak to what your, your interest is. Um, so the first section, um, and this is, well, first of all, there is um, a summary of all the primary recommendations, um, key recommendations as they call them, and that's on pages 18 and 19 of the plan. So if anybody's interested and they just wanna get a quick snapshot, you could open up pages 18 and 19 and see what the key recommendations are. And then the plan goes through section by section with much more detail about each thing. And the first section is urban design. Um, and the first part of urban design really focuses on those metro neighborhoods. And that, that is going to be the, where the most time in the plan is spent because that is the place that we see the most potential for redevelopment um, and the need for redevelopment is in that metro, those me what are called those metro neighborhoods. Um, and so in that area, the sector plan under this urban design is promoting um, quality building and site design, prioritizing the development at strategic locations to, so that redevelopment occurs, it builds off of um, each other, um, wants to focus improvements along existing streets that connect to the metro and to concentrate public open space and locations that um, support existing and proposed connections. It's all about urban design that um, focuses on how the buildings work with the streets and how the streets work to provide connections and access that is um, amenable to the public. You know, people wanna walk down these streets, they're not huge. Um, they have something activating them, people wanna be part of them. And then they've brought into all of this as well, um, urban design elements that work for open space. And so there's also a whole list of um, uh, recommendations in the plan. They're also in the staff report, the um, urban design elements related to buildings. Um, then you have a list related to open space. Of those, they have open spaces connected to natural areas. They have a minimum one acre town square uh, within the west side of the WMATA owned property, a two acre town commons on the east side of the WMATA owned property. Um, they envision a promenade of a linear park um, leading to the metro station. Um, and then there's recommendations related to recreational facilities and other miscellaneous open spaces. And for the prominent metro properties, you will have um, a repeat of some of these urban design recommendations in a little more detail. So while I'm kind of broadly going over them, um, where they are really prominent in the plan and prominent for the metro properties, you get some of these recommendations again in more detail. Perfect. Um, Let me uh, just also briefly, uh, first of all, welcome Councilmember Katz, District Councilmember, and Gwen, would you like to introduce your team, please? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited that we have the staff who've worked on this plan, and uh, they've been led by Carrie Sanders, who's the division chief for our Mid-County Planning Team, and Jessica McBerry, who's the supervisor for master planning in Mid-County. Um, the lead plan lead is Nikosi Yearwood, who has been a longtime planner, has worked on our White Flint plan, and now on this plan, and is uh, doing a great job, is uh, well known and trusted in the community. Uh, Luisa Estrada, who is our urban designer, and Steve Findlay, who's our environmental planner. So if you have questions on any of those topics as they come up, Oh, and I should mention, we also have Rebecca Ballo, who is our Historic Preservation Supervisor, and John uh, Lieberts, who, um, is who are going to be available to talk about the Historic Preservation um, recommendations. And we do have Mike Riley and Dominic Quattrochi and Nitty Figueroa from Parks, if you have any questions about park-related topics. so. We brought everyone. You have anyone available to answer questions that may come up. Great, thank you. Okay, Pam, thanks. Okay, um, so with that, and uh, looking at the broad, the whole section on the urban design um, section, the way it's written, the, the strength of the recommendations, they are um, definitely guiding, uh, but they're also flexible. And so um, council staff supports all those area-wide urban design recommendations in that first section. Um, can we just ask uh, planning to share with us some of the 
vision here for the urban design elements and you know what kind of what, what how's this community going to look and feel um this is luis estrada with the planning department um basically we are um drawing from the vision of the 2006 plan uh, which had um, fairly robust um, urban design components built into it. Um, um, what we what we've tried to do is is to refocus a bit um, the notion of of comprehensive development so that we can be um, more more uh, tailored about where development can actually happen um, in our estimation. Um, as we look at the area and as we look at where connections are possible and where open space is realistic to happen and 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 where density can actually be achievable, then then we have created something that we think actually can in the in the nearer term the start to deliver the type of environments that actually were envisioned by by the two thousand and six plan. Um, so, the notion is that we're focusing on the on the Walmart properties primarily because they have the greatest density. It's the largest gap within within the planning area, and we think that development in those properties can actually start to stitch together um, development that has happened as a result of the previous uh, sector plan. So once once that starts to come into fruition, then then uh, connections can be completed, open spaces can be delivered. And, and, and a greater sense of, of place can be created by delivering a mix of uses that is substantial enough that, that can create opportunities for people to sort of live and, and re recreate um, um, in, in an urban setting, so to speak. And given that the area is so intensely used by transit users, uh, our sense is, is that that sense of place is really needed in here and, and to introduce and stress out um, the, the walkability components and, and, and the notion of having a decent open, amount of public open space that is actually usable by the community in here that is anchored by development and activities that, that this could actually be beneficial for the area. I was just going to add, this is Carrie Sanders. Um, uh, Luis uh, has done an excellent job with the Veers Mill plan and providing a lot of detail with these uh, um, conceptual diagrams that you see in the plan. So we did go into a little bit more detail with this plan because we are finding that's really helping with our uh, regulatory development review process in the mid county. Um, you know, we're seeing applications now come in for viewers mill and they are using a lot of the concepts um, that was that were shown in the plan that are illustrative, but are really helpful in making our development review process uh, more seamless and, and more efficient. You know, this might be a time to mention um, how this ties into some things you're going to see in the general plan, because the, one of the concepts that you're that we're going to propose for your consideration as part of the general plan is the idea of complete communities. And what uh, Chairman Reamer said at the outset of this discussion is really on point. We want to make sure that places like right on top of a heavy rail investment with Metro have not just a lot of stuff there. It's not just development on top of Metro, but it's development that really hangs together and creates a center of gravity. And that means a complete community. More specifically, that means a mix of uses and not just different uses, but different building types that serve a wide range of people in terms of their housing needs, different income levels, different types of housing, different sizes of housing, different kinds of retail or commercial uses all together, not just concentrated. Yes, we want it to be compact and we want it to be dense to take advantage of the investment in Metro, but we also want a diversity of uses and building types so that it can all work together as a whole. And really that's what transit oriented development d should mean. And too often it's just meant, well, let's, let's, we have a Metro station, so let's just try to make sure there's as much stuff there as possible to take advantage of that investment. That's part of it. But if you look at what's happened at places like New Carrollton, for example, you see how just putting a bunch of development on top of a metro doesn't necessarily make a community. And that's what we're trying to achieve here is creating a community that used to be an end of the line park and ride type of a of a concept for for metro. And you're going to see more of that as we talk about the general plan. So I wanted to preview that for you. Cool. All right, good. 
So, Pam, we are we are just uh, recognizing the urban design elements, um, which are creating a center of gravity and and creating a a place that will uh, be really desirable. And in order to do it, we got to have a lot of development happen. You know, this stuff doesn't happen by itself, and the county government's not going to really build much of this. It's going to be private sector. Okay. Um, okay, so with that, um, we're now at the top of page four on the staff report, um, and we're heading into the next section, which is the land use and zoning section. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the draft has been organized around a series of neighborhoods, um, and those neighborhoods proximity to the Metro Station. Uh, the Metro Station neighborhoods are Metro West, Metro South, Metro North, Old Durwood, and then two together that are Shady Grove Station West Side and Jeremiah Park, those two grouped together. Um, there's also a significant and quite a number of um, existing residential neighborhoods um, in the plan area on the um, east and south side of the plan area. And there's also some transitional and industrial zoned um, areas that we'll cover. Um, but the first one, the Metro uh, neighborhoods um, is the first one that's covered and they, um, they really create the core of the plan area. Um, they're within primarily a half mile of the Metro station um, and they are the most um, likely proposed for new development that's anticipated in this area. Um, the first which one is these, Metro West. Which of these are actually owned by WMATA? Um, well, there are certain properties within the neighborhoods that are owned by WMATA. So yeah. in the Metro West neighborhood, um, key properties are the WMATA Metro Surface Parking Area and then the Thomas Somerville property. Right. These are within a quarter mile of the Metro Station. And so the first um, land use and zoning recommendation in this neighborhood is for that WMATA Metro property, um, its surface parking lot and the Somerville property next to it. So it's, it's a zoning recommendation across all three, but it does cover the WMATA property, one of the WMATA properties. Um, and so the recommendation is it's currently CR 1.5. 75, C of 0.5 and R of 1.5 and a height of 160 feet um, with a TDR overlay of 1.77. Um, and the recommendation is to rezone this to a CR of 2, the commercial FAR of 1, the residential FAR of 1.5 and a height of 200 feet. Um, and the one thing I wanted to, to kind of note for the committee, because this is a little bit unusual, is that you're seeing a CR zone with a TDR overlay. Um, and the staff report goes into kind of explaining how that happened, which is um, it's a vestige of the fact that the, um, the CR zone was created based on the TOMX2 zoning. The 2006 master plan put TOMX2 zoning in these locations. Um, and when it put the TOMX2 zoning in these locations, it also recommended the TDR receiving area. So when they developed, they would get additional density, additional residential density for the purchase of TDRs. Um, in 2010, so that was in 2006. In 2010, the TOMX2 zone was really used as a template and was the basis for creating the CR zone. Um, but we know that when the CR zone was created at the same time, the building lot termination program was also developed. They were developed kind of together. And the CR zone requires um, incentive density. So anybody doing optional method development, portion of that development has to purchase some level of um, building lot termination easements. So it kind of moved away from this idea that we were um, using properties to purchase TDRs um, and now moving into purchasing a, a building lot termination, which is actually more truly preservationary because it takes um, even a residential dwelling off of 25 acres in the agricultural reserve. Um, and then what followed after that in 2014 was the zoning ordinance rewrite and then the district map amendment. And what that did was it was trying to consolidate zones to not have quite as many zones in the county. And one of the zones that it um, removed and translated into a different zone was TOMX2 became CR, right? If it was the basis for CR, it made a lot of sense to, to translate it to CR and that's what occurred. So you have this kind of weird anomaly where in Shady Grove, it translated TOMX2. And again, we kept all the same TDR receiving areas and you've got TDRs and CR zoning, which is a little odd. Um, so the master plan recommendation for this property is to not retain that TDR receiving area. And that's not shocking because they will have this BLT requirement if they redevelop. Um, the only thing I wanted to note though is though, um, 
So the, the recommendation for the residential density is equal to what it was in 2006, I believe. Um, but the TDR really did indicate that the anticipation was for a slightly higher residential density. And so my recommendation would be just to bump up that residential density and of course equivalently the total density to just make it equivalent to what was envisioned for that TDR density back in 2006 plan. Good, good recommendation, thank you. All right, why don't we talk here a little bit. Uh, Council uh, Member Katz has uh, uh, signed in. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for allowing me to participate and everybody else who's participating. Um, Pam, when as we go through, could you note if a property owner has given their thoughts on the piece of property, either that they own or or that is near them, the, the homeowners association and whatnot. I was trying to follow as an example, whether WMATA did weigh in and I couldn't find it that fast, they did not. Okay, that's yeah. one of the reasons I couldn't find it, I guess. But whether like the Somerville property, whether or not they've given any indication, what whether they like this or not, if, they can, if they've given an indication. So, Councilman Marquez, that's a great um, point. What I will note for you then is um, when we had the public hearing for this before the council last week, you had five speakers. Yes. Um, and we haven't received very much uh, written correspondence either. Uh, the city of Rockville has written in after the staff report was written, and I'll try to note for you things that they were, they brought up in their testimony. The biggest um, property owner related um, um, correspondence we received was from the EYA property. It's, oh, that's yeah. in the staff report, and I know what that, that correspondence is. So where we had correspondence that was particular to a property and specifically to zoning, I tried to, I did note it in the staff report. There's been very little, and maybe planning can tell you if they've had contact, because they usually do talk to these property owners while they're developing the plan. Perhaps they did, and they're happy with what they got, so that it's kind of quiet in that regard. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. I mean, to that point, I understand that WMATA is, very excited about what they can do here and that thanks to the uh, tax incentive that we created that they are very optimistic now that they can do some pretty impressive projects there uh, that have been stalled for a long time. Um, so Mr. I, if, Mr. Chair, if I could suggest perhaps they would like to send a letter into the record saying that. Yeah, well, I, was gonna, I, mean, yeah. I think it would be good business for all of us. Thanks. Why don't we, um, you know, why don't we ask for some presentation about what they intend to do? And I think either planning could do that or WMATA could do that themselves if they, if we can get them, put them in. Um, I don't think we're going to finish this plan today. So perhaps for our, our, our uh, next discussion, we could just get a quick 15 minute presentation from them that talks about what they're doing now. This is Carrie Sanders. We can certainly ask them to do that. And um, they have been coordinating with us uh, frequently throughout the plan and reviewing the recommendations before we brought them to the board. But we definitely can uh, invite them to a future work session. Yeah. I mean, generally, I think they're enthusiastic about what recommendations are you've presented for them. Uh, however, it would be great since they are such a large stakeholder here. You know, it would be interesting to hear from them more directly about what they're going, what they're looking to do. Certainly. All right. So I agree with staff's recommendation just on the tweaking the zoning. Any comments here? Andrew. I was interested to hear from planning on their thoughts, but generally I'm supportive of this as well. I think, you know, being uh, uh, consistent with the density recommended in the 2006 plan makes sense, but I, I was just curious to hear from planning if there were any issues or concerns related to that. It seems like a fairly modest tweak to your proposal, but I didn't want to presuppose without hearing from you. Yeah, I'm going to let Carrie and Nikosi uh, speak, but I think we're generally supportive of the recommendations of council staff, but Carrie or Nikosi, if you'd like to say anything else. Um, you know, Thank you, um, we're supportive of the amended recommendation. Um, my computer just crashed on me, so apologies if I missed anything. Um, but yeah, in terms of the recommendation from Ms. Dunn, we're supportive of it. 
it adds yeah. more opportunities for Metro to uh, redevelop uh, the, the property. Um, and we believe that's um, that's something that meets some many uh, countywide goals. Appreciate that. I will reiterate, I do think we need to have an in-depth conversation about TDRs and BLTs. I'll save everybody uh, from that conversation as part of this, but I think uh, Ms. Dunn, you know, raised, you know, some of the, the, the broader dynamics there, but I won't dive into that and ask those questions here. I don't think they necessarily exclusively relate to this uh, particular proposal before us, but I do think there are broader questions of how the you know, TDR and BLT uh, dynamics play into our, you know, current affordable housing goals in particular and just the broader development process because you know, we have a lot of priorities and uh, how they all fit in together and what the practical implications of, uh, you know, have significant impacts on policy and on placemaking and on communities. I think we need to address that. So I just want to put a marker down for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, and then um, I'm just a little bit interested, speaking of Metro, of what what does high intensity mixed use development mean in, in, in practicality? Is that high rise development? I mean, is that what we're talking about here? Is that what we're in, in envisioning here? Like at, at what point is it high intensity and at what point is it is, is it not? I mean, I understand this is an aspirational thought process here, but just curious on that because, um, you know, I think it's important that we both set aspirational goals of what we want, but that we not set, you know, totally unrealistic community expectations of what could happen. That's why I think it would be very helpful to, you know, have, you know, what, you know, WMATA is looking at doing here uh, as well, because, I, you know, I fully support affordable housing goals. I fully support uh, you know, large one acre civic greens the, to support the community. I fully support, you know, all of these things. I just want to make sure given the other conversations that we've had about the practicality of some of these uh, redevelopments of, uh, you know, how practical it is and what we actually expect to, to get out of it. I just think it's important that we flesh that out. So, so to give you some context, council member, um, we, we have worked with Metro on this draft plan and in including uh, they hired a consultant to do a bit of in-depth analysis regarding what we were thinking in our recommendations and they're supportive of the board's draft plan. And in terms of your question regarding um, sort of high intensity, we're thinking primarily about something that's beyond what we see now in, in some metro areas in terms of a five level building. That's why we're going up from uh, what was previously recommended in the plan from 160 up to 200 feet for the west side. Um, that obviously creates a lot more flexibility regarding potential build out that uh, could occur on that portion of the WMATA property, uh, given the other needs that, infrastructure needs, I should be clear, um, that are required to promote, to allow any significant development to, to happen on that side. So in terms of intensity, we're definitely new thinking Vertical concrete construction, something beyond uh, a mid-rise or, or going further beyond 10 stories on the west side. As well, you could also include some mid-rise development as well in terms of what we've recommended. So that flexibility is sort of built in in our recommendations. Okay, thank you. I would also add that um, um, Council uh, Member Friedson that we removed the, the staging elements of the plan that that did um, require very high cost uh, infrastructure improvements that may not necessarily be aligned with our current uh, plans. And so um, that also uh, allows a little bit more development flexibility for the plan area going forward. So we think that some of those changes will allow for some of the other broader benefits, including affordable housing, green space, uh, and obviously the need for more housing that's transit accessible. That's correct. Yeah, the, many of the staging improvements from the um, 2006 plan were, were fairly focused on um, moving cars through the plan area versus uh, building more high density at transit. So I think when we removed those staging elements that, that were more focused on, you know, auto movements, uh, we have better fulfilled the goals of transit-oriented development. 
appreciate that. Okay, thanks. I'm supportive of the staff recommendation as well. Uh, I just want to note that I did make an error um, in the middle of page five where I bolded the council um, staff recommendation. I have a typo in the height and I have 120 there. It really should be 200. Two paragraphs above where I stated it is 200. So I just didn't want anyone to be confused about that and I'll correct that. Thank you. I, I support the corrected version. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, so that takes care of the, um, the Wamato Metro property in this location. There's, there's another, um, and then there are other, uh, properties also in this, um, Metro neighborhood, um, with the recommendations also listed on page five to rezone the commercial properties between 355 and Somerville drive. This includes the uh, Montgomery County teachers credit union, um, uh, going from a, a total FAR of 1.5, uh, commercial of 0.5, residential of 1.25, and a height of 100, um, up to a CR of 2 with a commercial of 1, residential of 1.5, and a height of 120. That's correct there. Um, rezoning the Midway Shopping Center to provide it with um, almost basically what it has now. It's removing a T, which was a, also a vestige of the um, uh, district map amendment, and then uh, rezoning the public storage facility to giving it a little bit more little density um, for commercial and overall uh, so that it is conforming. Um, so those are the rest of the recommendations for Metro West and council staff agrees with those. I don't know if you have any questions on those. No, I think without objection. All right. Okay. Um, and this is where I said also that um, the, the general urban design section was great because it laid out a full vision for the plan area and particularly um, how to redevelop an area that, that is going to undergo change with a, a lot of context sensitive recommendations. Um, and here under this neighborhood section, you again have some reiterated more, a little slightly more detailed urban design recommendations that are consistent with the other ones, um, but it'll be easier for an applicant coming forward and for planning staff reviewing applications to be looking in the master plan and seeing those more detailed recommendations here and um, council staff agrees with those as well. All right. Okay. Um, you know, without controversies, it's sort of hard to, you know, it's like we're, <laughs> we're just moving through. We're used to, a different style here, but, uh, you know, we can get used to this too, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the next neighborhood is Metro South. Um, it, it includes a variety of light industrial uses. There are automotive service uses, storage facilities, retail businesses. Um, there's a vacant property at Redland Road and Somerville Drive um, with some redevelopment potential for residential and non-residential uses. Um, the plan recommends um, for the Metro South properties for that vacant Somerville property um, recommends a CRT of one point, uh, or, sorry, going from 1.75 um, with commercial of 0.5, residential of 1.5 and a height of 90 feet with also a TDR overlay um, to CR to um, C of 0.5, R of 1.5 and a height of 120. Um, so it does increase the height a bit. Um, and this is similar to the very first one we talked about that had come under the TDR overlay. And it's the same recommendation to just bump that total FAR and that residential FAR by 0.25 to make it consistent with what had been there under the TDR overlay of the um, 2006 plan. And the height is the height? Uh... The height's increased. The, the current height is 90 um, and the planning staff, planning board are recommending it to go to 120. Okay, no typo there on the height. No, no typo there. Um, so you said this property is vacant. I guess I didn't realize the Somerville property is vacant. Um, there are a couple Somerville properties. This is one that's at the um, intersection of Redland Road and Somerville Drive. Yeah, this one is vacant. And this is the furniture company or? There's a plumbing company. Plumbing company. And they were operating a warehouse here or something like that for, for years and no, their, their headquarters, well, they have a headquarters in, in Montgomery County and one in Prince George's, um, but the main one is across the street from this vacant site, which is at uh, Redland, Redland and Somerville Drive. Okay. 
And what do we know about their interests? What's been, were they active in the plan? And um, they've been well, they've been active on and off over since the 2006 plan. Um, but they, they they've talked primarily in the past, not recent, um, regarding redeveloping their headquarters, which is right adjacent to the metro property. Um, but they really were thinking that that would, could be accomplished with some joint development between themselves. And Metro, and given the the board's recommendation, that's a possibility. That's in the that, that could happen in the future. Okay, very good. All right, keep going. Okay, so that one's everyone's okay on board with that. Yep. Recommendations, right? Okay, so bump those a little bit. Um, and then the next one is uh, the remaining properties in the neighborhood. Again, um, it bumps the um, it goes from CRT to CR zoning. Um, total density is up by 0.5, um, and the residential density goes up by 0.25, and again, it gets the higher height of 120, um, so that it will hopefully redevelop under the CR zoning, providing public benefits um, that the plan recommends as uh, affordable housing being the top public benefit priority. So anywhere we talk about going to CR zoning, which a lot of these properties do, and we talk about getting public benefits, the plan very... Um, significantly states that the highest public benefit priority will be affordable housing uh, and recommends it that 15% affordable housing. Okay. Good. Good. Um, and again, when you're on the staff report, if you're on, I'm on page seven standards and how to make a um, consistent and walkable block pattern, but then if you can't, what are the things to consider, which I think is extremely useful because, you know, as um, uh, Ms. Sanders was saying and Mr. Estrada, that, you know, the plan is extremely thoughtful in the way that it um, wants to get this uh, environment where people want to live and want to build, um, but also wants to be flexible enough and recognize that as they go through redevelopment, some of the, the envisions you know, the visions you may have for something may not be possible. So what are the alternatives? Um, and the plan really speaks to that. So that's really good. And those are at the top of page seven. Um, council staff would is concurrent with all of those recommendations. With the urban design elements. Mm -hmm. Right. Good. Okay. Um, the next neighborhood is Old Durwood. Um, and this neighborhood is the oldest part of the sector plan. Um, it's historic resources date back to, 18, to the 1880s. Um, the sector plan seeks to reestablish the residential character of this portion of the area. Old Durwood is predominantly residential east of the train tracks um, and south of Redland Road and west of Crabs Branch. There are institutional uses here as well, um, including um, Durwood Bible Church, a Pepco substation, and the state school initiatives. Program uh, station um, recommends residential development on that uh, vehicle emission station site to again kind of redevelop. Oops. We lost your video, <laughs> but I can hear your audio. Yeah, sorry. I I'm clicking on yes, but it's not letting me restart it. I think it's like a network connection. Oh, the host has stopped it. It says. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're okay. like Obi Wan Kenobi now. <laughs> Fine by me. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Oh, um, so for the um, the vehicle emission station, um, the idea to, to again kind of reestablish Old Durwood as residential, um, where there's an opportunity to move away from some of these more industrial uses, like the vehicle emission station. Um, the plan sees that as beneficial and has zoning recommendations that would allow um, both residential and non-residential and uses on that site. So the recommendation for the vehicle emission station is yes, in fact, to relocate it um, to another location if that's possible. And in doing so, um, rezone this property from R90 to the commercial residential neighborhood zone um, with a one FAR total and a one FAR residential. Um, and then to be cognizant of any noise mitigation that would need to occur if, if the site is redeveloped. Right. So this is a state property, right? Yeah, it is. It's the state vehicle station. And they own it or they lease it? 
Um, they're the owners. They're the. I actually had the occasion to. I was there last week or a week and a half ago to get my, the uh, you know, update or whatever. Um, and I so I got to see some of the area. So is the idea here that if you you know that a private property you know a private developer would basically bid on. Hey, state of Maryland, I'll build you a new facility somewhere else and take advantage of this zoning here. Is that basically what you're hoping to have happen? That's a yes. Okay. The recommendation we've been carrying forward from the 2006 plan that, as Ms. Dunn mentioned, the recommendations overall for Old Durham were to sort of reestablish the residential nature of the area and to move away from some of the industrial. Uh, light industrial uses that are there. And I think this whole area of, uh, covered by the Shady Grove plan is an interesting area in that there are so many pieces of land that are either owned by a governmental entity or um, you know, quasi-governmental like WMATA. And it really means that, that in the entire plan area to get some positive change moving forward, really the uh, goal is to do co-location and, um, you know, really these kind of public-private partnerships. And, uh, you know, each of those is complicated and each of those takes time to put it together. But in an area that, you know, is somewhat built out, but we're looking to try to get positive change going and to create a better as the as Chair Anderson said earlier, complete community. The answer has to be co-location and public-private partnerships because there's not enough land untouched to be able to really do it any other way. Andrew. Yeah, so a couple of questions here. The first is if our goal is to get more residential, then why are we doing it CR? Like if, if, the, if the whole purpose of this is to restore the residential integrity of the community. So, um, so I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. It is to recommend a CRN zoning, CR neighborhood, but the commercial component of that is zero. So it really is in a sense, um, a residential um, compatible zone. It just has building standards that are also more flexible and compatible um, for redevelopment. Okay, CRN. Okay, I, yes. I thought Sorry about that. I heard CR, so I just wanted to. I wasn't sure. clear, yeah. That makes sense. The, the other aspect of this, I mean, while I appreciate the aspirational nature of master plans, I do think that we create community expectations. And this is a state property. I mean, we're, you know, we're dealing with the bus depot. That is completely within the county and the school system's power to move. And we have so far failed uh, to follow through on our commitments. Uh, to move it. Hopefully we'll make progress on that sooner rather than later. But um, I am a little bit concerned with creating an expectation in the community that we're going to get a completely different type of use on a state property without any indication from the state that that is even remotely likely to happen or even under consideration. But I think you know, the master plan is also the time that applies the um, zoning to meet the vision. So this is the time to do the rezoning that would make some sort of redevelopment possible. If we did not redevelop, if we did not rezone this property as part of this master plan process, and five years from now, the state said, oh, we have a great idea for a co-location, we would have to tell them the zoning doesn't work for your co-location idea. You're going to either have to do a local map amendment or go right. through some other long process. I'm not arguing yeah. that it shouldn't be zoned and we shouldn't zone it in the way that we would like it uh, should it be moved. I'm just a little bit concerned if we frame it in the master plan as we're proposing that the vehicle emissions inspections be moved and we have not proposed a place to move it, nor have we been in any conversations uh, in any serious substantive way. And so we've set a community expectation that is not realistic and not serious. So I'm just a little, I, I appreciate, I support this. I'd prefer 
if there was the residential use uh, there, I'm just a little bit concerned of throwing things out there and uh, getting community buy-in and setting a level of expectations that are just not real. I think it in some ways can undermine our other efforts within master plans, which we're supposed to follow through on, or at least attempt to. Well, and it may be that, you know, per your, um, the, you know, your, your concern, maybe the language should not be simply relocate the inspection station, but it should be relocate or co-locate with other developers on yeah. the same site. I think I would prefer, it, you know, should there be an opportunity to co-locate you know, with more appropriate residential use or re relocate that this would be uh, the, the zone. I mean, I just, I just don't think it's serious to say, you know, we're putting in a master plan that you should move something without providing a place for it to go and, or any discussions uh, for, for how to make that happen. I mean, I, you know, aspirations are, are nice, but if we never follow through and really have no chance of uh, following through on, on the goals, I, I do think that it, undercuts some of the other efforts. At least that's my perspective, but I'll I'll let the chair weigh in. I mean, I understand your point, you know, at the same time, I don't, I think the master plan is the appropriate time for us to take a long-term view and say why we are proposing zoning for this site that is otherwise a vehicle emission site. Um, you know, the, I think the idea is that, and I, it definitely occurred to me when I went there, like there's a residential development literally next door. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it, it should go, you know, so I think it is relevant for us to say, we don't envision this being there for the long term. I, to your point, I mean, I think it is important for us to temper expectations and, you know, I, I imagine there are those in the community saying you haven't even Move the bus depot, and now you're talking to us about you know moving the veep station. Like, when are you going to move the bus depot? Um, but uh, on the other hand, I think the bus depot conversation was created less by a master plan and more by an actual development agreement. You know that the county entered into and then had to revise. So you know, I I. I would be open to language that tempers expectations, but I do think it's really important for us to adopt the recommendation of the plan. And I would just note also, like electric vehicles are going to be an increasing share of the market. And, you know, maybe the need for this station, you know, maybe 15 years from now, the actual footprint of this station is substantially smaller than it is today, you know, because vehicles aren't getting tested as many vehicles aren't getting tested, I don't know. Um, so there are possibilities for a co-location. There might even be a, 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 re a real a reasonable strategy. But uh, anyway, I if there is a way to temper expectations, that probably is always helpful. But I think it is, I certainly also think it's important for us to adopt the, the long-term vision here. Well, yeah, I, I just, if you're going to be aspirational someplace, this is a place to do it. And, you know, we haven't, done the uh bus depot we need to do it we we need to move this you know this is this feed stations you know environmental if you have environmental racism in a textbook it's uh you know you'd have a, a, a picture of this and i don't think we should shy away from saying that we would like to see it gone and then you know put pressure on everyone involved to make it happen so you know to the extent that we can realizing it's, you know it'd have to be a, a lot of moving pieces so so i'm fine with the language as is but you know i if there's some sort of compromise to, as Ms. Wright suggested, I, you know, I think I'm fine with that as well. All right, why? Well, yeah, I'll just point out, I mean, there's there's not a lot of disagreement in this whole plan. There's not a lot of disagreement here either. I mean, to be honest with you, I just wanted to raise the point that, you know, this is aspirational. I support the aspiration, but we also should be able to fulfill the commitments that we make. In, in master plans or at least be in a realistic position to pursue them. And this is one that's a, a little bit tougher than, than others. So, if, you know, if there's a way to, you know, slightly temper the language to reflect that, great. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, this isn't a hill, certainly, that I would 
die on. I think I largely agree with what everybody has said here and what the goal and intentions were of uh, planning who put this forward. Um, I'd be happy to circulate just a slightly revised bullet for this recommendation to the committee members and, and um, we can come back to it later. Okay, that'd be fine. I mean, I will say what it's not a very complicated facility. Um, you know, it, it, and it, since it's cars and not buses, it may not be that difficult for a developer to find another location. I think the question really would be, is the other location also a good location for Montgomery County? You know, because people need to be able to get to it. Um, having said that, I don't think the bus depot is that complicated either, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I think we've made it more complicated than what it really is. And I think things like this uh, have a funny way of being or appearing more complicated than they were when they were being discussed, uh, largely because, um, you know, most people you know, don't want a facility like this in their backyard. Change is very, uh, you know, difficult um, and, you know, it's hard to do. So I, you know, I, I will just note that it, it's easy for us to say here that it's not hard to find another facility. I think in practice, it, it, you know, we might run into uh, similar uh, uh, dynamics. And I will also point out, it's not necessarily our decision. That That is what makes it uh, comp complicated here too. Yeah, we, we, did, we did turn the, uh... The tech road, or you know, the uh, industrial road, veep to a, a, a testing station pretty quickly. You know, the the uh, but but no, I I take your point, uh, Councilmember Friedson, and and I think that all those buses at the bus depot are are one big difference <laughs> between. But but yeah, no, I think I think we've beaten. I'm sure, this you that a bus depot is a very complicated question. Yeah, if it wasn't, we would have solved that one a long time ago. All right, let's keep going. Okay, we'll move on. Um, uh, so basically though, council staff, uh, recommended, uh, supported, it was concurrent with these recommendations, but I will circulate just, we could even just uh, change that first bullet to encourage the relocation. It doesn't have to say, you know, but whatever, uh, we can communicate after this. Um, the next property in this neighborhood is the towns at Shady Grove. It's 149 unit residential development. Um, it's located at the western and eastern intersection of Redland Road and Yellowstone Way. Um, the plan recommends that the um, property be rezoned um, from a PD35 uh, zone currently to a CRN zone. Again, no commercial, just residential. Um, and mostly this is being um, motivated by the fact that in the rewrite, uh, the PD zones, the um, plan development zones, they were retained on the map, but they were requested that they are no longer reconfirmed um, as plans go through the master planning process, um, but an equivalent zone to what is there on the ground or that the planner see is appropriate, um, be put down in its place. And so in this instance, the planning board has recommended that instead of PD35, it gets a CR of one FAR, um, residential FAR is the same and a height of 65 feet. Um, and staff supports that recommendation. All right, let's keep going. Um, the next property is a 3.8 acre, uh, the Durwood Bible Church property. It has a cemetery as well, um, and it's located at the southeast intersection of Yellowstone Way and Cheekton Avenue. Um, there was a uh, residential development uh, proof for this property previously, but it was never implemented as the property owner could not uh, relocate the church. Um, and the planning staff has just recommended to confirm their existing zoning. Um, if they do ever find a purchaser for that property and a new home for the church, then residential development would be appropriate for the site. Their zoning is R90 um, with a TDR overlay, so we would get TDRs out of this property under redevelopment. And um, council staff agrees with that recommendation. All right. Okay. The next property is the Durwood Business Center, uh, which is an office industrial condominium. It's located along Durwood Road. Um, there's a small range of businesses. It's about 2.5 acres in size. Um, the uh, planning staff's recommendation, planning board's recommendation is to confirm um, their current industrial zoning on the property, um, but to recommend a floating zone, a commercial residential neighborhood floating zone um, suitable for the property under redevelopment. So it doesn't change the zoning today. It allows the property owners to continue operating like they are uh, without any uh, increase in sort of taxation uh, because of a new zone. But if they ever want to develop, they can, they can request that zone. Good approach. We good? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, the next 
property is the Derwood store and post office. And this is one of the um, last vestiges of Derwood's history. Um, in the 2006 plan, the property was placed on the locational atlas and index of historic sites. Um, in May of uh, 2019, the Historic Preservation Committee uh, Commission recommended uh, designation of the property um, to the Master Plan for Historic Preservation um, and supports the rezoning of this property for residential category that would allow for an adaptive reuse and restoration. Um, the is that already allowed? Can they already do residential on that site? Or is it, we need the zoning in order? It's a yeah, it, it, it can do residential, but it's R200. So um, there's every chance that it would not be conforming at that site. Uh, the property may be too small, maybe wouldn't even be able to um, accommodate one house, or if it could, it probably wouldn't be compatible with the existing structure, I think, which is the concern. And what they want to do is to really be able to rehabilitate that existing structure and reuse it. Um, that's that's right. That's what I meant. Can they can they already rehabilitate the structure as residential, or they're not allowed to? No, under the existing zoning, they can do R two hundred, which is single family houses on half acre lots. And so this structure might at one point have been a single family house on an R two on a half acre lot, but now we're looking at more density. But since it's an historic preservation, the density would be so that you could put in little apartments. Right, exactly. Okay, makes sense. I mean, it, there's residential right across the street. I mean, it's a, a natural conversion. Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't know, Rebecca, did you wanna say a few words before I get into the zoning recommendations? It does have testimony in support from the Historic Preservation Commission and Montgomery Preservation Incorporated. I just will note that, that to- uh, The only thing, um, oh, sorry. Yes, this is Rebecca Ballow with the Historic Preservation section. Um, thank you, thank you, Pam. The only thing that I would add is that when the property was, was last inhabited, it had already been converted into apartments in the 19, in the 1970s, there were already multiple residential units on the property. So in a sense, we're looking to even, you know, restore that and then enhance it further so that there can be a successful adaptive reuse on the site, as Pam had mentioned. That's all I'd add. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, that was really helpful. Um, so the only comment that I would make then is the planning board recommended a CRN zoning of with one FAR, zero commercial, um, and a one residential and a height of 50 feet. Um, but it also states that it really wants to encourage not only the mix of unit types here, CRN would allow that, um, but also to uh, support flexibility in the development standards, which are really important for old properties that may not meet zoning um, development standards, um, including the ability to waive some of those standards. Unfortunately, the CRN zoning is only under standard method. It wouldn't allow for the waiving of any of these standards. So the recommendation is just to make it a CRT property instead of CRN, um, give it the most tiny amount of commercial available, which you have to do in CRT. Um, and then we have in the draft plan some additional language about how that has to respect the residential neighborhood. And that would allow this um, property that everyone wants to see get redeveloped and reused as a historic structure, but with all the flexibility that it needs to make that really possible. Um, so is the idea that the site would be developed with some additional buildings around it, or this is all- I think it is, yeah. But maybe Ms. Ballo can talk to that as well. Sure, I, I can add a little, and then I would look to to my other colleagues in planning um, to Kosi, um, perhaps if you if you'd like some more information. Um, the idea we've been working very closely with with the current property owner who supports the historic site designation, um, who testified as such at the Historic Preservation Commission. And yes, the idea is to add a larger addition onto the historic building um, to allow for more residential units. So the the idea has always been that there would be a fairly large addition onto the back, um, perhaps also utilizing some of the basement space as well to really fully build out the site to have more residential units. Gotcha. Okay, and that makes sense. And since you're saying it, I presume it <laughs> that the problem from the historic, uh, you know, designation. So good. Okay. So. Um, the committee is okay with my slight change to just make it so that they can waive those development standards for redevelopment. I think it just makes sure they can actually do what they want to do with the property. 
without objection. Okay. Um, all right. We're moving on to the next neighborhood, which is Metro North, Wamata. Um, it has two structured parking garages and three surface parking areas consisting of about uh, 4,800 parking spaces. Um, and it's on about 25 acres. Uh, so quite a large area. It's owned by Wamata Metro. Um, there are also several ride-on and uh, Maryland Transit Authority bus bays, a kiss and ride area. Um, in the very back part of the property, there is a, a stream that bisects the northern parking area. Um, the zoning recommendation for the Metro North Wamata property, currently it's a CRT of one, the commercial of 0.25, a residential of 0.75 and a height of 70 feet. It does have the TDR overlay, but it's only 0.88. Um, so the new recommendation is CR 1.5, the C of 0.25, and R of 1.25, and a height of 100. Um, and again, this moving to CR and having um, you know additional density uh, would get those public sector uh, public benefit points. Um, again, with the highest percentage priority being affordable housing. Um, and council staff supports this one. The, the translation, the, the proposed zoning in this case actually covers what was the um, expected TDR density by a little more even than the 2006 plan. So we don't have the same, the same TDR issue on this property. Okay. Good. Any questions here? No. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. And again, there are some urban design um standards here, recommendations, things that they are specific to this property, um, and they get at where to put the highest building heights, um, establishing the internal network of streets and pedestrian activity, circulation, points of access for the garages, um, and again, addressing that uh, stream that's in the back, perhaps creating a linear park as an amenity for the neighborhood. So those are all urban design recommendations that reinforce the ones in the beginning of the sector plan, and um, certainly would make this site a better uh, location for people to want to walk, uh, live, um, or recreate. So council staff supports those as well. Okay. Urban design elements for the WMATA properties. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we're in the last neighborhood of the Metro neighborhoods. It's called the Shady Grove Station, West Side, and Jeremiah Park. Um, the the Shady Grove Station West Side is 45 acres. It's a new development, um, and it implements several of the recommendations that were in the 2006 plan. Um, it has the relocation and redevelopment of the Montgomery County Service Park um, that was initiated in 2012. Um, all the public facilities from the western portion of that um, public facility have been relocated to either the new multi-agency service center in Montgomery Village or to the Fleet Management Equipment Maintenance and Operations Center. Um, the Shady Grove Station West Side is a public-private partnership between Montgomery County and EYA. The first phase of the residential townhouses is close to completion, um, and this requires 25% of this development to include affordable housing, including workforce and MPDUs. Um, the Department of General Services and EYA have agreed to provide a public library within the multifamily building, which would be in the next phase of development. Um, the recommendations for this uh, rezoning would be from a CR T of one, C of 0.25, R of 0.75 and height of 90 feet with a TDR overlay to CRT, basically to almost the exact same zoning. It just removes the T, which was uh, a vestige of the um, district map amendment in 2014. Um, and given that this is an ongoing and already working uh, development relationship for this property, council staff supports that recommendation that supports that process underway. I just, I just want to add that tomorrow's Read Across America Day, so and I'm the lead for libraries, so I'm very, I'm very happy to <laughs> hope this comes to fruition. So, great, thank you. Um, okay, the next one's Jeremiah Park, so 45 acres, um, and it does have the Montgomery County School Bus Depot, which occupies about 35 acres of this 45 acre area. Um, in the plan, uh, houses more than 400 buses. Um, and it's adjacent to a former park department uh, training and maintenance center property, which is about 10 acres in size. Um, and the sector plan uh, amendment, it reconfirms the 2006 plans um, recommendation to relocate that bus depot to other appropriate sites and to minimize, uh, to maximize public investment um, 
and create a transit oriented community at the metro station. Um, in 2012, there was an approved preliminary plan for redevelopment of the county service park. Um, the approved plan requires the dedication of a combined 1.8 acre park and an elementary school site, along with 689 residential units and 25% of these as affordable, um, including workforce and MPDUs. And the public park portion is 1.4 acres, the school portion is four. Um, the zoning recommendation for this property um, is to basically increase the height slightly. Um, it retains its TDR overlays. And the idea is that it will implement um, the current preliminary plan on this site to get the school site, uh, the park site, and the residential development. Should the bus depot relocate? And this was a place we did receive, again, testimony for the plan. We did not get a lot of testimony on this plan, but we did get testimony in support of relocating the bus depot. Um, and council staff supports this recommendation. Okay, how does the school fit into the long-term planning? Um, I don't know if NCOSI wants to talk about, if he has more knowledge of the way the planning has been discussing the preliminary plan that's already been approved for the site that requires the school site. Sure, um, and the, the long-term forecast for this plan updates as well as the previous plan indicated that an elementary school will be required sometime in the future and the case, the uh, Jeremiah Park property was identified uh, in the 06 plan as the preferred location. Um, we had a backup, which was the Piedmont Crossing, which is now a park. Um, so we're really planning for the future that within the Gatesburg cluster, within the, this plan area should be providing uh, an elementary school and this is a preferred location. The joint development between the county and others per the preliminary plan that Pam had mentioned um, had carved out through the work with uh, MCPS to get the eight plus acre combination park school site that would run onto Crabs Ranch Way, multi-level school um, that will really provide the school, elementary school that's gonna be needed for the future. Okay. Okay. All right, well, we will get an update on the bus depot at a future but near term time. We'll, we'll work on setting that up. Um, the next uh, uh, section that the plan looks at uh, is termed the transition areas. Um, it, in, um, it identifies properties that are east of Crabs Branch Way and west of the Metro Access Road. It includes uh, the Grove Shopping Center um, and Shady Grove Crossing. Um, Shady Grove Crossing itself is located just south of the town of Washington Grove. Uh, it's a 65 acre, 65 acre property, formerly known as KC at Mill Creek Piedmont Crossing. Um, it is currently developed with 61 residential units, a neighborhood park and historic meadow. And the town of Washington Grove acquired the 12 acre historic meadow, um, designated through legacy open space, um, and is now called Washington Grove Conservation Park. Um, MNC PPC still maintains the 12 acre meadow and um, the parks department hopes to acquire or has acquired a 9.7 acre property adjacent to the um, inter-county connector um, to turn into a future park. Currently there's no uh, pedestrian or vehicular access to it. Um, the plan reconfirms the current zoning for these properties as R90, they are residential. Um, this would cover all the residential development plus the historic meadow and the vacant park property. Um, this was a place that you did receive some testimony. Uh, this had to do with the request for, for solar being um, recommended for installation on the um, Washington Grove Conservation Park. Um, I think that um, at the time of the um, uh, overview for the plan, you received comments from, I think, Chair Anderson about sort of the fact that the parks already has a very robust process to evaluate solar on all park facilities and park land. So um, uh, I don't know if I would agree with that statement. I think the parks department should have a robust process to evaluate solar, uh, but I, I don't, I'm not sure that we have that today. I haven't seen a lot of proposals from the parks department to install solar anywhere. Um, 
Okay, I'd like to talk about this. I'm actually enthusiastic about this idea from Washington Grove. I'm, I'm not certain that it has to be written into the master plan as I think that was Jerry Anderson's point. Um, but as a, you know, let me just understand the context here a little bit. So this 12 acre meadow was acquired by the town of Washington Grove and then was designated as legacy open space and then parks acquired 9.77 acres of the 12 acres. Mm -hmm. that That's a separate parcel. That's, they're just two separate things. You have the 12 acre conservation park and you have another 9.77 acres that's located over near the ICC. They're okay. separate. But the that, one question, the one you had testimony about was the conservation park. Say that again? The one that you received um, uh, testimony on from the town of Washington Grove was about the conservation park, the 12 acres. So it's about the conservation park, which is a meadow, and which is not going to be, would not be, well, I mean, we'll ask planning, and Sydney yeah. sounds like he wants to. Yeah, talk, I, but if I, I, if I, I do, believe, I you, believe with, with um, my, sorry. thank you, Mr. Chair. Before you, believe, before you talk, before you talk, okay. I just want to make sure I understand it before. Okay. So Washington Grove is asking that the meadow should be used for solar. No, okay. Do we have an image that Nicosi could pull up? Because I think looking at a map will help explain this all. Thank or you. Nicosi or Pam, I think yeah. we need a map. Yeah, just be before I do, just to be clear, there, there are two parcels. Yeah. One is a conservation meadow, as Pam mentioned, that's owned by the town of Washington Grove, managed by the planning commission. Adjacent to that, there was a former school site that was acquired by parks, nine plus acres that's undeveloped. That's the area that residents in the town have expressed an interest in putting a solar array on. So I'll find an image and we could discuss more. Let's do that. Great. Okay, Sydney. Yeah, and and to just be nice, a, a little bit more confusing um, because we need this. Um, the it's my understanding that state highway or Maryland Transit Authority or somebody else with three initials um, owns another parcel right near there. And so there's some suggestion, some question, whether or not for solar, uh, where this could be and how this could fit in. I'm supportive of solar. And, you know, to Chair Anderson's point um, at the public hearing or the prior to the public hearing, the discussion about whether or not solar needed to, the, the, the actual uh, discussion about solar needed to be in the master plan, as long as solar can be there, as far as I'm concerned, the goal is to get solar there, not to have it mentioned in the master plan, if it can be there. So that's, that's where I am. But there is, I believe, another parcel that there's a possibility that there could be some solar located on it as well, um, if State Highway or Maryland Transit Authority would go along with that as well. Thanks. Andrew. Andrew? Yeah, sorry, I was, my, my screen changed to the share screen, which makes it go full instead of half, and so I missed my unmuting because I, my, it was not aligned properly uh, when that happened. Yeah, just a couple of things that I think we should clarify for, for folks. I think it's important that we look at it. It's the ICC interchange is the uh, the inside of the round circle. I don't know if you want to call it a jug handle or an interchange or uh, wh whatever it is. That's the additional parcel. I don't think it's required as part of the proposal, uh, but it has been raised as a possibility uh, to make it an even more viable potential uh, solar site because there's even more critical mass uh, potentially because I don't know how many acres is that I would I would guess that's what three or four acre uh, uh, area inside the uh, interchange but it would you know it's it's in close enough uh, proximity I will point out there are some issues with federal highways and solar arrays which we hope will change uh, that prevent the use of you know just like you can't add a toll lane to an existing funded uh, you know, right of way, there are some uh, uh, limitations there. So I don't think that should hold this up, but I do think it's important that we uh, note the possibility as has been uh, raised and pursue that on a parallel uh, track. I, I also think this is interesting. I met with the uh, folks from Washington 
uh, Grove municipal officials and other uh, 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 residents uh, there. I think this is an interesting uh, proposal. I, I would be interested to hear uh, from uh, parks, since this is a park uh, property, of, of what the future plans uh, were for there, and then also if there's a possibility of doing both, of you know, if this isn't going to be turned into an active use park for 15 or 20 or 25 years realistically, uh, then can we do solar now and then address the uh, park part later? And then the last piece that I think is important for us uh, to, to understand um, is uh, including it in the master plan, does allowing for, I mean, if the master plan includes this as a park, uh, will that support pursuing this solar possibility or would including uh, both uh, be uh, something that will allow us to pursue uh, both, noting the fact that, of course, this is Park's property and they're going to have to decide on how to move forward. I do think it's uh, definitely a very intriguing possibility to pursue solar here. Uh, thanks, uh, Council Member Friesen. Uh, this is Dominic Quatroki with the Department of Parks. Excuse uh, me, Don. This is Mike. I've got this. Okay, Mike. I apologize. Fed Committee members and Council Member Katz, uh, good uh, morning. I think it is still. It's good to see you all. Mike Riley, the uh, Parks Director here. Uh, I just want to clarify that the Parks Department does have a very robust uh, sustainability plan that includes solar. We generate approximately 25% of the Parks Department's need for solar uh, ourselves today with over 8,000 uh, panels installed across the system, including rooftop and uh, ground mounted and uh, parking lot canopy solar. So we do have a sustainability coordinator overseeing that program and we do have aggressive plans to expand uh, solar on parkland in the future. Um, I did become aware over the last month of the proposal by the town of Washington Grove. Um, I have an upcoming meeting with them to discuss it next week. There are a lot of considerations to look at. Uh, this is a, uh, a this is currently one of many. Uh, it's Piedmont Crossing Park, I think about 10 acres. It's one of many uh, undeveloped local parks we own, and you you know what our average local park looks like at the end of the day. It has ball fields and tennis courts and some natural areas and whatnot, but we have not at all begun any planning processes or done any environmental studies or really started any planning process, but I believe up to date the park is, uh, is, is considered a, a, a local or a community park. Um, so I am uh, very interested in continuing this dialogue with Washington Grove. As I said, we're very huge supporters of uh, solar, uh, generating clean energy. We're a major player. We have been and will be in achieving the county's uh, climate goals. But uh, as I appreciate uh, uh, Council Member Katz mentioned, I don't advocate that the sector plan amendment predisposed uh, that solar will go on this particular property, but I'm certainly wide open to continuing this conversation. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I would be interested to follow up, you know, in the near to midterm here about park strategy for solar. I know that you guys generally build it for your own needs. Um, and it sounds like you, I think you just said you provide about 25% of your own needs through your own solar. Um, so that's good. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I'm theorizing that you could do more, you know, that parks land, there are places in the county where you might be able to house community solar installations. Um, and uh, I would be interested to, take a look at the inventory from that angle. Um, so I'd, I'd love to follow up on that and just generally, you know, see what your long-term plan is for solar. Um, so Pam, if we could just book a conversation, you know, maybe we can find some time during the budget for a detour into the solar conversation. Um, so second now, for this immediate proposal. So once again, just to reiterate, the, the town of Washington Grove is saying, we recommend the Piedmont Crossing site. It should be a community solar array. And 
it's how many acres is that site? Uh, I believe it is about 10. It's about 10. And a part, obviously, not all of it is developable, as you can see from the drawing up here. Some of it is covered in forest, but I believe about half of it is envisioned for recreational development. And from your perspective, uh, there, what is that in the queue? Like, what what is a reasonable timeline? If there were no discussion about the solar, what, what is a reasonable timeline for when parks would have funding for that construction? There, there is no current funding even to begin the planning work in our six year program. And I'll uh, I'll come back with a more definitive date about you know in what time frame we thought we would progress to a planning stage. But the, the flip side of that is not just, is there money to develop a local park with recreational facilities here? It's also, where does this fall in terms of the suitable, suitable and prioritized sites for solar? So it's not just, will you have some alternative use for this property? It's, is this, we've done two solar farms so far. Is this number three? I don't know. We really have no idea because this proposal came to us after the planning board had it reviewed the staff draft, worked on the plan for several months, and there's nothing wrong with people from the community coming forward and saying, hey, how about solar here? But we just have not been in a position to evaluate not only what is the future of this park in terms of the capital budget, but where does this fall on the list of sites that would be the optimal to put the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth solar farm that the parks department is going to build? So that kind of gets to my earlier comment. I think it would be you you do already own this, right? You have owned it for some time. Um, so it could have been, you know, a community solar installation without the master plan process. It's just that it cropped up now. So to your point, I would, again, I'd like to follow up and we'll do a review of, you know, what we'll ask you to review your inventory um, and then come to us with a, I think a vision for what it is that you think, you know, you should create, you know, some goals um, and we can talk about what those would be. And then, you know, that can help us uh, inform the conversation. Um, you know, it sounds like that it would be helpful to have a, a coordinated plan. And it sounds like, you know, given that you're not sure if this is, solar array, solar field number three, that, you know, there isn't a number three otherwise designated. Um, well, I, I would say that, and we can get into this in the briefing, I think you'll find we have done some thinking and work on where number three, four, and five would, would be. It's just, I have no idea where this, how suitable or not suitable this site is in relation to anything else, because it kind of came in very, very late. But I think you'll be impressed with the, with, all the work that uh, our sustainability folks have done on on solar specifically and how far we've come and we can get into that in any detail that you that you'd like great so we will follow up on that just to you know, I'll, uh, I'll interject real quick dominic from the parks department uh, we have looked systematically at all 400 or so of our parks uh for suitable size constraints uh for solar arrays and we have a ranking of the park properties. I will say Piedmont Crossing Local Park didn't make the cut or come it's close to making the initial cut because of the local park designation and the thinking that we would be putting recreational amenities here. And based on the size, it doesn't look like you could have a viable solar array and park amenities on what would probably amount to about five acres of unconstrained land. Okay. Um... But I think this is important to look at in the context of other, other sites, and you'll see why it is that the Parks Department considers certain sites more suitable or less suitable, and you can give us some direction, and we're happy to, you know, re recalibrate our approach. But I think you're going to find that the Parks Department has put a, quite a lot of thought into this, and there is a, a method to their uh, madness. Okay, so two two additional points. One is... Uh, I'd like to understand it better, you know, the Washington Grove community, I think they, they may be envisioning a community solar subscription for their entire community. Um, 
you know, which is just sort of novel, you know, and it relates to their proximity and, and their, you know, their own cohesiveness. Um, and then if I understood it correctly, the idea was, could you do a 15 year lease? Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if that is something that the private sector would be willing to do, but, uh, you know, anyway, it's just a, a data point for the conversation as to what are we actually talking about? But, um, yeah, any other comments on this topic? I mean, okay, Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, it's my understanding that the, that the solar that they're looking at is about four and a half acres. Um, I do believe we should have the larger conversation. I believe we need a specific conversation, not necessarily for the master plan itself for, for solar for this site, but we do need to have a specific conversation. And I know that Mr. Riley, I'm going to sit in on that meeting. I believe it's coming up this week, next week, or whatever it is. I know it's, it's coming up soon so that we can have a good, good conversation about it. But I do believe that it's necessary to have the conversation in general sooner rather than later. And then we can see where, what we can do and how fast we can do it. And they are looking, it's my understanding, Hans, that they're looking at, I believe, a 15 to 20 year lease, but of course, you know, it has to, it has to work for all, for all involved. It has to work for the private sector as well as everybody else involved. Okay. All right. Good. So we'll, we can follow up on I, that. I have a question. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. I couldn't see sorry. No, it's okay. Um, well, a couple things. One, um, in order for the uh, active park use uh, to be developed and viable, does the Amity Drive access or any other road access, uh, you know, does that, is that required? Because, Correct. I mean, right now, this is, this, 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 this is forested and there is an, a relatively open meadow uh, here that has access, at, at least from the maps, uh, to nothing. Yeah, council member, you, you need a connection between Amity Drive here where it terminates today to connect to um, Crabs Ranch extended here by the MCDOT uh, facilities. I should note uh, two things here. One, Montgomery County DOT, they currently have a facility planning work that has a looking at a bikeway connection from Crabs Branch Extended to the town of Washington Grove, um, either through the open space meadow, Brown Street, um, different, different alternatives they're looking at. And they're also looking at the connection between Amity Drive uh, to Crabs Branch, either a road or some other uh, pedestrian um, bike accommodation only. And I wanted to just add that, you know, this is a complicated little piece of property. That road connection is important. It was in the master plan before this even became a park uh, site. It's um, a part of the overall street grid system that we think is important to have built someday. Uh, it may be ways off before it gets built, but everything has been set up to build that road connection. And, um, you know, that also, again, isn't something that's going to happen in the very short term, but it is an important long-term part of the plan. Sorry, I don't understand. Are you saying that that line, that Amity Drive, will basically continue right across that whole parcel? Yes, if you can see the little part that looks like there's right of way for a road yeah. that extends from Amity and it connects down to another little piece of what looks like right of way. So with that in mind, is the park plan that it would build that road at the time the park is developed? It hasn't been worked out to that degree. Yeah, I think I would, they would need an access road for sure. I, I would no, I would not assume that there needs to be a new road here for access, but the, nobody has gotten to that point yet. I mean, yeah, it's true there's a conservation park on one side, but and there's forests on the other, but it's not like that's the it's not like there's some physical barrier there. You I would just urge you not to jump to conclusions about what could or couldn't be built at this location, whether it's a recreational facility 
or solar farm or road, this is part of the reason why we think it's not a good idea to be hyper-specific in the master plan because further analysis of this site and it really needs to be done and in light of in light of other things like capital budget priorities and in light of other priorities for what the county wants to do like solar energy all those things need to be hashed out and i submit to you that you know uh march 1 2021 at the fed committee while we're doing this master plan is not the place where we're going to get to a really solid answer to any of those questions. We have a process for doing this and you will continue to control it through the budget. You can review our facility plans. You can review our plans for solar and recreation. You can review DOT's plans for additional road connections. All those things are going to come straight through you. But really, the master plan is not a place where we can hash all this out. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. So I, I just want to understand, as part of the master plan process, I agree that we shouldn't presuppose the master plan. I do think this is an interesting proposal. I think that, you know, having a local park here requires a road network that doesn't seem to be anywhere in the near-term uh, plans. I think long-term, I would agree that that is an important connection. I think that there uh, could be, a, a you know, a, a, a short and medium-term proposal, which in a master plan environment is like, zero to 15 years and a long-term proposal, which is like 15 to 100 years, um, um, you know, for this, that, that, but we shouldn't dictate necessarily the outcome, but allow for the possibility for this to be uh, considered and, and, and discussed. Having said that, if the master plan specifically states this is an active use park, does that presuppose in the other direction to prohibit the uh, solar from being uh, pursued here, or is there a way without presupposing to allow for this to be considered without dictating uh, that a an, an active use park as has been envisioned? Uh, you know, we don't want to eliminate that, but we want to add into that the pursuit of uh, you know potential solar here. We we have absolutely no objection to saying in the master plan that we can, should consider this range of options and how they interact with each other. If, if, if there's a desire to include some recommendations that says, look at this site for opportunities for, you know, renewable energy, for active recreation, how that fits in with the road connection, fantastic. We can, we can work with that. We're just trying to avoid being you know, locked into what amounts to a facility plan type dis decision at the during a master plan. That's all we're we're getting at here. Yeah, I think there's more agreement here than disagreement. I think the details have to be fleshed out. My my uh, um, preference would be for us to have language in here that allows for uh, the uh, possibility to pursue a potential uh, solar uh, array here. Uh, with Washington Grove or otherwise, because, you know, parks may want to pursue it themselves um, and not eliminate, uh, you know, you know what this was purchased for, which is for an active uh, use park. Uh, you know, I, I think our goal here should be and not, uh, uh, you know, necessarily uh, one or uh, the other. And I, I think that we need language in the master plan that reflects that. That would be my personal preference here. Allow for flexibility, which we try to do, um, but uh, make sure that one of those possibilities uh, is uh, pursuit of this novel solar concept. I would suggest that we would want language that says something like the community or Washington Grove community has, you know, proposed or has asked about solar. My only, my only concern about us saying this site should be looked at for solar is then suddenly others might say, well, you can't use any other site unless the master plan has designated that for solar. Um, you know, so, but yeah, I think a reference, I, I think this is part of the planning process. This idea has come out, albeit at the, you know, late in the process, but it has come out and there's no reason not to refer to it in the, in the documents, we don't. We're not going to make a decision about it. You know, we don't have to make a decision about it. I don't think we want to be in the situation of saying that solar, you know, community solar installations or solar fields 
you know, have to be decided through the master planning process, mm -hmm. right? That would be actually problematic. So right. um, I think it's more appropriate just to kind of talk about how this came up as it's a you know, relevant item. Pam? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, so in the plan, um, we can definitely add language like you're suggesting to, to at least give context that the Washington Grove community has inquired about solar. But then under the recommendations, there is a bullet that says develop a local park with active recreation on the vacant parks department property. So it's a very discreet current recommendation in the plan. So I think that's why council member Friedson expressed some views. So that bullet itself, rather than develop it with active recreation could be modified to, you know, consider the vacant um, park property for um, active recreation or renewable energy uses, or you could just take the bullet out. Like, but that bullet will need to be either taken out or modified given this conversation. Yes, that is specifically, thank you uh, that was a good catch. for raising that. And that is specifically why I was saying it should say, and or, uh, you know, solar. Um, you know, that, that would be my suggestion. I, I prefer not to take it out because I, I think we don't want to yeah. look like we're abandoning proposals for why, you know, for this, for the community. The question is, you know, there are two purposes for this land that would both be beneficial to the community. One would be active use, uh, recreational park, uh, local park. The other would be uh, solar. And uh, we should figure out a way to, you know, the goal should be to, you know, provide a, uh, a public use for for this land and uh you know pursue it uh you know and there are lots of details that have to be figured out the master plan is not the place to put it but we can signal uh what uh, would be appropriate and i do think it's important for us uh to include that okay. sydney thank you very much mr chair um i agree the bullet point should be modified uh to allow for for what we we're discussing and it should be also noted that uh, what Washington Grove has been pursuing is a is a lease of the land, not necessarily to to sell the land or to use the you know to have the land be used for uh, anything other than be owned by the park. So I, I think that we need in, in some cases we're putting the, the the cart in front of the horse on this one. I think we have to be careful that we can put it the right way as well. But I do think we should have the larger conversation so that we can figure out what's the best way to go forward. Thanks. Okay, um, I think we should uh, wrap up after we finish this conversation. Um, the only other thing I wanna add, you know, I think any, I, I don't yet really fully understand the conservation park and how it is used and what its limitations are, but I would presume that any vision of this area ultimately unites those two parks and that some uses could be, you know, interchanged, um, you know, across all the land that the county owns. Um, so, you know, I don't know that it has to be anything new is on one side and, and the other side is uh, in stone. Um, well, that, uh, uh, Mr. Reamer, I think that's a very constructive suggestion to, to consider these pieces together. Thanks. For, you know, the range of, um, objectives that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, at the risk of igniting some kind of, you know, controversy, it sort of seems like the elephant in the room here. We've got a lot of land, and, and indeed we've talked about the ICC Cloverleaf and whether there's some way to gain access there. Okay, so uh, we're going to tweak the language. As we have discussed, I think we all kind of understood that. Um, and then separately, we will uh, follow up to have a more expansive conversation about uh, solar. Um, and uh, I think that's a good place for us to pause for the day. Could, could I just ask, Mr. Chair, that yeah. the staff uh, state what we're, what we're tweaking and what exactly we're tweaking to? I, I think I understand, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's just general language in the plan about describing the area um, and in that text we can add about the inquiry by the Washington Grove community for some solar um, energy generation in the nearby park uh, so it's not a recommendation but it does place just context for it mm -hmm. under the bullet where it currently says develop a local park with active recreation on the vacant parks department property we can put um, something like 
um, consider or uh, the local, the vacant parks department property should be considered for active recreational use and or um, renewable energy generation or a potential co-location of the two and just kind of leave it broadly like that. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, that's what I thought and, and I'm supportive and I'm glad that the Washington Grove folks chimed in and I think it's a, a very interesting and promising idea. So look forward to the continued discussion on it. Thank you. I do have one final comment here. So first of all, I think properties, I think it should refer to all the properties and there is a specific issue now that I think about it that we do need to explore, which is, you know, is, is essentially Washington Grove able to get lower energy rates than the rest of the surrounding neighborhoods. You know, I mean, credit to Washington Grove for coming up with the idea. I think what they're proposing is something that is essentially allowing them to get clean energy. And I wonder if, if we need to consider, you know, other communities as well um, while respecting their, their entrepreneurial role here. So I just think it'd be worth talking, making sure we have a clear understanding of the broader policy implications uh, of who this energy would be available to, given that it is county land, you know, and I, my understanding is that they're seeking to be able to essentially have a no cost lease, uh, that that's how it would become viable. Um, and that, you know, that could be fine. However, I think we have to ask the question of whether Washington Grove can be the only community that is allowed to benefit from it, you know, under that circumstance. So. Anyway, I just think there's more more to be probably another reason why it's not really a master plan, you know, uh, specific specific item. But any other comments here before we break? Mr. Chair, yeah, if I could please. It is my understanding that Washington Grove is not only looking at it for Washington Grove. I know that Emory Grove and other areas that are adjacent to okay. Washington Grove would be a part of this discussion as well. So okay. it's not just for the town itself. Well, that's helpful. I think that's uh, that's good. That was my understanding after I met with them as well. Specifically, Emory Grove is uh, one of the uh, focuses that uh, they had raised of providing uh, you know low cost clean energy to those residents. Uh, as well in other surrounding communities. But again, I think the biggest piece here is this is not, you know, this is too specific of a project to be dealing with as we've talked about before. There are a lot of nuances uh, to this that you know aren't appropriate for the master plan process, but we should, through the master plan process, allow for uh, the possibility for the conversation uh, to continue and for a serious proposal uh, to be uh, pursued if uh, it is appropriate. And so I think, you know, the language that we've uh, now agreed upon will allow for that to happen because admittedly there are uh, a lot of open questions uh, to you know work through and figure out that have to be addressed. Okay, good place to pause. Thank you. Thank you to planning. Thank you to Pam. All right, appreciate it. Thanks everybody. We'll uh, see you next time. Pam, when do we have a date scheduled for the next uh, committee? We do. Uh, the next committee meeting is March 15th, so it's in two weeks from today. Um, we had planned on doing transportation, but I think what we'll probably do is, um, I think we're a little more than halfway through the zoning recommendations and, and then maybe go through the other sections of this staff report and turn toward uh, the mobility section or, you know, if anybody has a different alternative, I could entertain it. But the 15th of March is the next one. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Very different.